Audio from the room. This is an audio test to the booth from the room. This is an audio test to the booth. Across WebEx to the booth. Confirmation in the booth. Uh, to any virtually attended uh, members that are currently in the meeting, I'd just like to give a reminder to please enable your video feed prior to the start of the official hearing at 10 this morning. Any questions or concerns, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Thank you. Test, test. Good morning. I'd like to respectfully ask that any of our members with a capital M in current virtual attendance, uh, please enable your video cameras. Uh, to make us aware of your presence uh, within the next minute or so uh, prior to the start of the hearing. This is Suzanne Bonamici, I'm on the uh, webinar. Good Web morning, Ms. Bonamici, I can see you and I can hear you just fine. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Suzanne. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Are you at home? Yeah, it's it's very early. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Washington. You didn't miss anything. I've been following it all.
Can you hear me okay if I keep the mask on? Can you hear me okay? Uh, good morning again, and just for purposes of awareness, the meeting uh, is being recorded and as well as broadcast live uh, through the recording studio and to the committee's website and um, subsequently YouTube. Uh, members can mute and unmute themselves at their own discretion. Uh, there is no controlled muting of members while participating in the hearing this morning. Good morning. The Subcommittee on Workforce Protections will come to order. Welcome, everyone. I note that a quorum is present. I note for the subcommittee that Mr. Courtney of Connecticut, Ms. Bonamici of Oregon, Mr. Norcross of New Jersey, Dr. Shalala of Florida, Mr. Levin of Michigan, Mr. Castro of Texas, Dr. Rowe of Tennessee, Mr. Wahlberg of Michigan, Mr. Guthrie of Kentucky, Mr. Grothman of Wisconsin, Mr. Smucker of Pennsylvania, Mr. Banks of Indiana, Mr. Comer of Kentucky, Mr. Watkins of Kansas, Mr. Mercer of Pennsylvania, Mr. Johnson of South Dakota, Mr. Keller of Pennsylvania, are all permitted to participate in today's hearing with the understanding that their questions will come only after all members of the Subcommittee on Workforce Protections on both sides of the aisle who are present either in person or via remote participation pursuant to House Resolution 965 and the accompanying regulations thereto have had an opportunity to question the witnesses. The Subcommittee is meeting today for a hearing to hear testimony on examining the federal government's actions to protect workers from COVID-19. All microphones, both in the hearing room and for those members participating remotely, will be kept muted as a general rule to avoid unnecessary background noise. Members will be responsible for unmuting themselves when they are recognized to speak or when they wish to seek recognition. While a roll call is not necessary to establish a quorum in official proceedings conducted remotely or with remote participants, participations uh, wherever there is an unofficial proceeding with remote participation, the clerk will call the roll to help make clear who is present at the start of the proceeding. At this time, I ask the clerk to call the roll. Chairwoman Adams. Present. Mr. Desaigne? Mr. Tacano? Present. Ms. Jayapal? Ms. Wild? Present. Mrs. McBath? Present. Ms. Omar? Omar. Ms. Stevens? Present. Chairman Scott? Present. Mr. Byrne? Here. 
Mr. Walker. Mr. Klein. Mr. Wright. Mr. Murphy. Mrs. Fox. Chairwoman Adams, this concludes the roll call. Thank you very much. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, opening statements. Let me remind uh, all of the committee members, uh, whether you're here, I mean, if you're particularly remote, please mute your microphone. Thank you. Pursuant to Committee seven, Rule 7C, opening statements are limited to the chair and the ranking member. This allows us to hear from our witnesses sooner and provides all members with adequate time to ask questions. I recognize myself now for the purpose of making an opening statement. Today's subcommittee hearing will explore the, the performance of the federal government in protecting worker safety during the COVID-19 pandemic. I want to thank OSHA Deputy Assistant Secretary Sweat and NOSHA Director Howard for joining us today. The COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in the worst worker safety crisis in OSHA's 50-year history. Nothing compares. In the past four months, more than 62,000 healthcare workers who we've asked to risk their lives without protective equipment have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and at least 291 have died. And this is an underestimate. According to CDC, these shocking numbers are a mere fraction of the true toll due to the absence of reporting by as many as 27 states, New York City, and the District of Columbia. And as we know, infection outbreaks have not been limited to healthcare facilities. More than 17,000 meat processing workers have been infected and estimated 66 have died. One Iowa Tyson plant saw 60% of its employees test positive. A Greeley, Colorado meatpacking plant closed after hundreds fell ill, although the plant promised to test every worker before reopening. The plant identified so many positive cases that it stopped testing and reopened anyway. Prisons, long-term care facilities, grocery stores, transportation systems, and warehouses have all experienced deadly outbreaks. Earlier this month, the CDC reported 2,778 infections and 15 deaths among staff employed in correctional and detention facilities. From late January to late April, fully 36% of all reported infections at correctional facilities were suffered by staff. At least six employees of one warehouse in New York have died from COVID-19. 129 New York City transit workers have died of the virus. As of last week, 1,424 Veterans Administration employees have been diagnosed with COVID-19 and 31 have died. Some 2,400 postal workers have tested positive and six have died from COVID-related illnesses. United Parcel Service is facing an outbreak of 36 cases at its facility in Tucson. But as we will discuss today, we don't really know the toll to workers because this nation has no system for collecting data on COVID-19 infections in the workplace. And employers are not obligated to publicly report these infections. Some government agencies refuse to make this information public due to employer concerns about adverse publicity, leaving workers and the public unaware of what risks they are facing. We cannot lose sight of the fact that this is largely a tragedy inflicted on our nation's essential workers. People who don't have a choice on whether they have to go to work. 
people who don't have a choice on whether they, uh, or many of those are on the are front liners. They're low income workers and disproportionately people of color who don't have the luxury of teleworking from home. COVID-19 is largely a workplace disease and a community tragedy. In Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, coronavirus cases linked to meat workers represent 18, 20, and 29% of the state's total cases, respectively, according to the Environmental Working Group. My home state of North Carolina leads the nation with the number of meatpacking plants facing an outbreak with the State Department of Health and Human Services reporting that at least 23 plants have outbreaks with more than 1,300 worker infections. Yet OSHA, the agency that this nation has tasked to protect workers, have been largely invisible. It's failed to develop the necessary tools that it needs to combat this pandemic, and it has failed to fully use the tools that it has instead focusing principally on issuing press releases and voluntary guidance. This hearing will focus on why that is and the price that this nation's workers are paying for OSHA's inaction. Deep into this pandemic, OSHA has still not developed any enforceable standards for employers to follow that can protect workers from the airborne transmission of the novel coronavirus. And OSHA's existing enforcement tools to combat this pandemic, which include standards covering respirators and personal protective equipment, are inadequate and unused. While guidance issued by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention can be useful, it's not binding. Only OSHA can enforce safe working conditions. And although OSHA says it uses its enforcement authority to protect workers, OSHA's own data shows that the majority of its inspections are conducted only after workers have died. And OSHA has conducted complaint inspections for less than 1% of the complaints filed. While the Secretary of Labor says it does not need an emergency temporary standard because OSHA already has the tools that it needs to enforce its guidelines through the general duty clause. The embarrassing truth is that OSHA has not issued a single citation under the general duty clause to enforce that guidance. Not one. This worker safety crisis was clearly foreseeable, and OSHA was warned. It was clear after the HINI swine flu that the pandemic in 2009, that an infectious disease standard was needed that requires employers to access the infectious disease risks in their workplaces and mitigate the hazards. Such a hazard as well along the way at the beginning of the Trump administration, but in February 2017, that draft standard was mothballed and relegated to the long-term regulatory agenda where it languishes today. In January 1, I joined Chairman Bobby Scott in calling on OSHA to put the infectious disease standard back on the active agenda. In that letter, we also urged OSHA to issue a compliance directive for the healthcare sector and to issue an emergency temporary standard if the situation deteriorated. At the time of our request, there were just five confirmed COVID-19 infections in the U.S. Hearing nothing back on March 5th, we wrote OSHA again, describing how hundreds of healthcare workers had been exposed and stated the obvious that OSHA urgently needed to issue an emergency temporary standard, an ETS. In mid-March, OSHA rejected an ETS on the grounds that the healthcare industry fully understands the gravity of the situation and is taking the appropriate steps to protect its workers. In April, with more than 720,000 infections nationwide, OSHA finally issued enforcement guidance, but only covering the healthcare sector. In mid-May, as workers continue to face risks of infection, illnesses, and death, the agency is still refusing to issue an emergency te temporary standard to protect workers from exposure to coronavirus. 
Here's what, Asia, what OSHA Act says. It says, shall provide for an emergency temporary standard if it determines that employees are exposed to a grave danger from new hazards and that such emergency standard is necessary to protect employees from such danger. Circumstances like this pandemic are the exact reason that this authority exists, yet OSHA continues to sit on the sidelines. So my question to uh, the Secretary of Labor is how tens of thousands of workplace infections and hundreds of worker deaths, why is OSHA missing in action? Failure to take meaningful action has sent a clear message to workers across the country that they are on their own. On Friday, May 15th, the House of Representatives passed the HEROES Act, H.R. 6800, which included COVID-19 Every Worker Protection Act, introduced by Chairman Scott, Representative Shalala, and myself. The bill directs OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard of seven days to protect workers in hospitals, meatpacking plants, and retail stores, restaurants and offices and shipyards and, and other workplaces where a person may face risk from exposure. The HEROES Act would also prohibit employers from retaliating against workers. As the states across the country begin to reopen, more workers will be at risk of infection unless OSHA starts doing its job. And if the reopening of workplaces drives up infection rates, states will be forced to reinstate stay-at-home orders, which do further damage to our economy. The only logical conclusion I can draw is that OSHA's inadequate response to this pandemic has been informed more by politics rather than modern science. The necessity to protect workers should not be cramped by state ideological notions about regulation nor campaign slogans about repealing two regulations for every new one that's created. Today we will explore and hopefully answer why there's been a lack of political will in the face of this public health disaster. And we'll learn why no one seems to care enough to even track the number of workers who are getting sick and dying. And finally, uh, I feel the need to respond to two items in Ms. Sweat's written testimony. First, we note that because of a lawsuit, Ms. Sweat will refu refuse to answer any questions about an emergency temporary standard. And I want to note for the record that there's no legal basis for this refu refusal. It's purely a political statement. And secondly, I want to respond <coughs> Ms. Sweat's testimony, which implies that criticism of OSHA's failure to issue an emergency standard or enforce existing standards does a disservice to the hardworking men and women of OSHA. No one has more respect for the dedicated men and women or the dedicated staff of OSHA and the hard work that they do every day than this committee, as evidenced by our advocacy for the agency's budget and the opposition to the torrent of rollbacks to worker safety protection, the failure to completely address the life-threatening hazards that working Americans are facing from COVID-19 is not the fault of OSHA professional staff, but rather due to the unfortunate decisions of OSHA's political leadership. I would like to now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Byrne, for his opening statement. Mr. Byrne, you are recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman, for yielding. Let me state for the record that the chairwoman is here physically present in this room. The chairman of the full committee, Mr. Scott, is physically present in the room. The ranking Republican member on the committee is physically present here in the room. I'm physically present here in the room. In fact, there are 15 members of this committee physically present in the room. Nine Republicans, six Democrats. It is a safe, environment, a simple environment, as you can tell, we are socially distanced. Not much has changed since the Democrats decided at the 11th hour to unilaterally call off last week's hearing. OSHA and NIOSH officials, my Republican colleagues and I were ready then to talk about the important work these ag agencies are doing to combat COVID-19, and we are here again to do so today. It is indeed unfortunate the Democrats decided to play politics on an issue that they assert is a top priority. The COVID-19 pandemic has been an extraordinary time for all Americans. Many of us are coming out of mandatory stay-at-home orders after two months or more. 
people are returning to work in a new environment with a disease that is still relatively new and about which we still have much to learn. We know the disease affects different people in different ways. Many people who test positive have no or mild symptoms, but a small percentage get very ill, and some of them, unfortunately, pass away. The two groups most likely to become very ill are those over 65, who make up 80% of all deaths in this country, and those with underlying health conditions as listed by the CDC. The disease also presents varying levels of risk for workers in different types of jobs. For example, an office worker who doesn't interact with the public faces much lower risk than a nurse in an ICU ward. I say all of this to make a point about the inherent difficulty in coming up with a reliable, single standard for workplace safety, whether it's for infectious disease in general or COVID-19 specifically. How did OSHA handle complex safety and health issues in the past. From SARS in the 2000s during the Bush administration to MERS, H1M1 influenza, and Ebola during the Obama administration, OSHA did not issue a new standard, but instead enforced, enforced existing standards and issued guidance, which in turn could be the basis for action against an employer under the General Duty Clause of the OSHA statute. Let me say that again. During the Obama administration, under three separate diseases, OSHA did not issue a standard. They issued guidelines and relied upon those guidelines for enforcing the General Duty Clause. When the Acting Assistant Secretary for OSHA during H1M1, which the chairwoman referred to, during that pandemic, a man named Jordan Barab, when he testified before this committee, in May of 2009, he said OSHA had created guidance, guidance, quote, to help employers determine the most appropriate work practices and precautions to limit the impact of the pandemic. He went on to say, because safety risks are greater in certain workplaces, OSHA is focusing its direct efforts on educating employers and employees in the high risk exposure categories. At that time, he said OSHA issued an occupational risk pyramid to categorize workers' risk, which demonstrated that only a small portion of employees were at the highest exposure risk level. Mr. Brab specifically referenced standards already in place for personal protective equipment and respirators. He said that OSHA would use the general duty clause, quote, to ensure that employers follow the practices that public health experts agree are necessary to protect workers' health. Finally, he quoted President Obama's assessment for the situation as being, quote, one for cause for deep concern, but not panic. What has OSHA done with COVID-19? Just like the Obama administration, it has issued detailed guidelines, placed an enforcement emphasis on higher risk workplaces, used an occupational risk pyramid category, categorizing workers' risk, and reminded employers of OSHA's existing standards on PPE, respiration, respirators, sanitation, and others, as well as their obligations under the OSHA Act's General Duty Clause to provide employers with a safe and healthy workplace. In addition, OSHA and the CDC have issued industry-specific guidance for healthcare, nursing home and long-term care, retail pharmacy, car service, package delivery, retail, construction, manufacturing, restaurant, and dental workplaces. And they're still working on it. There are two problems with requiring a standard. First, we are still learning about this disease, and we just don't know enough information to meet the level necessary and appropriate to construct an adequate emergency temporary standard and a permanent federal regulation. That's why the various guidance documents already issued are so useful. They can, be used, they can be issued relatively quickly and modified as we learn more from the CDC and other public health officials and from the workplaces themselves. A standard at this point would be an unproductive burden for businesses already struggling to reopen, potentially exposing them to unnecessary liability risks during an already challenging time and would do little to advance workplace safety. Second, Setting the standard just takes too long. On average, it takes OSHA 
seven years to compile all the data necessary and meet all the regulatory requirements for issuing a standard. I know Democrats want an emergency technical sta temporary standard, or ETS, which, according to their bill, must be done in seven days. The last time OSHA issued an ETS was in 1983, and that one was overturned because OSHA could not meet the statutory threshold requirements for issuance. Indeed, OSHA has lost more ETS cases in federal courts, in courts than it's won for the same reason. I know the Speaker included a provision requiring a standard in the bill passed by the House two weeks ago, a bill she created in her office without any consultation with the White House or the Senate, and on which we never had a hearing or markup in this committee, the Committee of Jurisdiction. No regular order and no effort to obtain bipartisan consensus. That's no way to operate the House with a challenge of this magnitude posed by the pandemic and our response to the pandemic. No wonder that bill is dead on arrival in the Senate. I also know the AFL-CIO filed a lawsuit last week to force OSHA to issue a standard. They filed a lawsuit. Expensive and time-consuming litigation against the federal agency responsible for protecting our nation's workers in the midst of a pandemic is unhelpful and very unlikely to succeed. And Madam Chairwoman, I take exception to your remarks about the witness's ability to talk about that lawsuit, matters involved in that lawsuit. No lawyer is going to let their client talk about something like that with pending litigation. It's a matter of every lawyer that has a client litigation like that is going to ask them to be careful about that. And to expect them not to follow their lawyer's advice is totally unfair to them. I must say that when I started preparing for this hearing with my staff two weeks ago, I was impressed, very impressed, with the diligence and speed with which OSHA has fashioned its response. Remember, we didn't even know about this, de this disease five months ago. Their experience with past pandemics surely helped, and I'm glad they both followed and built upon this experience. I've talked with hundreds of businesses trying to decide whether and how to reopen, and that's probably true for every member in this room. Those conversations always include a real concern for the health of their employees. They've consulted CDC, they've consulted local and state public health officials, and their industry organizations, and yes, they are closely following this OSHA guidance, which they are truly grateful for. They want to provide their employees a safe workplace, and OSHA is helping them achieve that. Isn't that what the OSHA statute's purpose is? Helping employers and employees keep their workplaces safe and healthy? I'm looking forward to the testimony today, and I thank the witnesses for appearing in the midst of what I know is a very busy time for them. Let's all work together to protect the most important part of the American economy the working men and women who make this country so very prosperous, including the healthcare workers, like my sister-in-law, Cynthia Dukes, who is an ICU nurse. I want her to be safe and healthy as she goes about her extremely important work, even as we sit here taking care of the sickest of us. She and her colleagues deserve nothing less, and they are best served by us when we work together for them and not for special interests and we stop the wasteful litigation and the partisan legislative games. America will get through this. We can protect our people who are most vulnerable to this disease and reopen the American economy safely as we start on another road to recovery and prosperity for all. President Obama was right. There is cause for great concern, but not panic. And if OSHA's response was the best way to go for SARS, MERS, H1M1, and Ebola, why is it not best for COVID-19? Thank you, and I yield back. I want to uh, thank the, uh, the ranking member, but I just want to just respond for a moment. Uh, Mr. Byrne, Obama started work on a permanent airborne disease standard, and Trump put it back on, on the back burner. And, Still, after 100,000 deaths, it's still pending. So uh, votes are going to be called in five minutes. But let me um, introduce 
uh, the witnesses. Um, any other members who wish to insert uh, written statements into the record may do so by submitting them to the committee clerk electronically in Microsoft Word by 5 p.m. on June 10th, 2020. Uh, let me introduce the two witnesses uh, before we'll have to take a break. Uh, our first witness will be Ms. Lauren Sweat. Ms. Sweat is the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Occupational Safe and Safe and Health Administration. She joined OSHA on July 24th, 2017, coming from this committee, where she was Senior Policy Advisor at the Committee on Education and Workforce for 15 years. In that role, Ms. Sweat handled workplace safety issues before the committee, including OSHA and the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Our next witness will be Mr. John Howard, or Dr. John Howard, excuse me, Dr. Howard is the director of the National Institution for Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. He's held that position since 2009. Dr. Howard previously served as director of the Institute from 2002 to 2008. Prior to coming to NIOSH, Dr. Howard was chief of the Division of Occupational Safety and Health for the California Department of Industrial Relations, Labor, and Workforce Development. Um, we're going to, I'm going to, do we adjourn now? Okay, we're going to proceed with the hearing um, and uh, with the witness uh, testimony. So uh, we appreciate the witnesses for participating today. And we look forward to your testimony, but let me remind the witnesses that we have we've read your written statements and they will appear in full in the hearing record. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7D and committee practice, each of you is asked to limit your oral presentation to five minute, uh, five minute summary of your written statement. And let me remind the witnesses that pursuant to Title 18 of the U.S. Code Section 1001, it is illegal knowingly and willfully falsify any statement, representation, written document, or material fact presented to Congress, or otherwise conceal or cover up a material uh, fact. Before you begin your testimony, please remember to press the button on the microphone in front of you so that it will, in turn, uh, the members can hear you. And as you begin to speak, the light in front of you will turn green. After four minutes, the light will turn yellow the signal that you have one minute remaining. When the light turns red, your five minutes have expired, and we ask that you please wrap it up. We will let both witnesses make their presentations before we move to member questions. When answering a question, please remember to once again turn your microphone on. Uh, Ms. Sweat, we're gonna first recognize you. Microphone on. Was on, sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to highlight the Occupational Safety and Health Administration's important work of protecting our nation's workers. I'm proud of the work this agency has done during the Trump administration, but I'm particularly proud of the work it is performing right now as it responds to a worldwide health crisis. The work of the agency continues uninterrupted even as we respond to this pandemic. Between February 1st and May 21st, OSHA received over 5,000 non-COVID-19 complaints and conducted 5,009 investigations based on these complaints, and 969 inspections. During this time, OSHA has also received over 2,300 non-COVID-19 whistleblower complaints, which are being evaluated along with the COVID-19 whistleblower complaints. I'm so proud of the dedication to OSHA's mission of our hardworking compliance safety and health officers and all of the agency's personnel. Our COSHOs are initiating thousands of investigations of complaints. Our compliance assistance staff are working with employers across the country to help ensure safe and healthful working conditions for the nation's workers. Our training and education staff have moved quickly to provide training to COSHOs and um, before, during, and after the pandemic, my goal is for OSHA's efforts to prevent workers from ever becoming ill or injured because they are doing their job. OSHA's efforts to address COVID-19 has been its top priority since February. OSHA quickly pivoted to focus intensely on giving employers and workers the guidance they need to work safely in this rapidly changing situation. 
Where appropriate, OSHA has also enforced safety and health standards. Throughout this crisis, the incredible men and women of OSHA have remained committed to carrying out their mission to keep America's workers safe and healthy. OSHA's initial response to the pandemic was to provide extensive guidance, often in conjunction with the CDC. Guidance has allowed the agency to be more nimble in response to the ever-changing understanding of the virus. OSHA continues to issue industry-specific alerts that provide targeted guidance on practices and procedures that will help workers' health and safety. To date, OSHA has issued general industry guidance, and it has also issued guidance documents to protect workers in numerous specific industries, including meatpacking and processing, healthcare, nursing homes, restaurants, dentistry, and manufacturing. OSHA has also distilled its extensive guidance into a wide variety of usable worker education segments available on OSHA's website. While extensive guidance is important to the rapidly changing dynamic of this pandemic as it continues, it is important to recognize OSHA's existing standards serve as the basis for its COVID-19 enforcement. Those standards include rules regarding respiratory protection, personal protective equipment, eye and face protection, sanitation, and hazard communication. In, existing, in addition to those existing authorities, OSHA has also the ability to take appropriate action against employers under the OSHAC's general duty clause. OSHA was recently sued by the AFL-CIO for an emergency temporary standard, and as we have discussed today, I cannot comment further surrounding the ETS or litigation. The flexibility and responsiveness allowed through guidance is apparent in the two revised enforcement policies issued last week by OSHA. As states are beginning to reopen their economies, OSHA is acting to ensure employers are protecting their employees. First, OSHA is increasing in-person inspections at all types of workplaces. Second, OSHA is clarifying its previous enforcement policy for recording cases of coronavirus. Under the new policy, OSHA will enforce record-keeping requirements for employee coronavirus illnesses for all employers. But to repeat, OSHA will not use guidance as a substitute for enforcement. Rather, the agency has the tools and intent to pursue both avenues. Where there are safety issues, OSHA remains, as always, shoulder to shoulder with America's workers. OSHA is charged with protecting the rights of whistleblowers under 23 statutes. As the Secretary of Labor has made clear from the White House podium, multiple national interviews and additional conversations with stakeholders, retaliation against workers is unacceptable. In this pandemic, OSHA inspectors are initiating thousands of investigations. This is resulting in employers receiving up-to-date information about how to better protect their workers. During the same time, OSHA inspectors continue to respond to non-COVID-19 worker um, fatalities and complaints. Through the tireless efforts of the entire agency, OSHA's continuous outreach and communication to workers and employers and its issuance of important, important guidance, OSHA is on the job protecting America's workers. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Sweat. Uh, Dr. Howard, you have five minutes, sir. Good morning, Chairwoman Adams and Ranking Member Byrne, Chair Chairman Scott, and Ranking Member Fox. My name is John Howard, and I'm the director of the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, which is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I'm pleased to provide the subcommittee information about the COVID-19 response activities undertaken by NIOSH over the past few months. To date, just over 1.6 million cases of COVID-19 have been reported to CDC. Many of these cases are in working age adults. For example, as of today, May 28th, there have been 62,690 cases of COVID-19 among healthcare workers with 294 deaths. However, the total number of healthcare worker cases is likely to be an underestimate due to data collection challenges arising from the pandemic. Currently, CDC and NIOSH are actively working to address the issue of capturing occupational data as it relates to COVID-19 cases. A new case report form released on May 5th added questions about workplace exposures for healthcare workers and workers in other critical infrastructure industries. States have been asked to start using this new form by May 15th. 
Activities by NIOSH as a part of CDC's response to COVID-19 fall into three main categories. First, respiratory protective devices. Through NIOSH's National Personal Protective Technology Laboratory, NIOSH is responsible for establishing criteria, testing, and certifying respiratory protective devices, including filtering face piece respirators. Uh, the most common type is the N95. During the global supply shortage caused by the pandemic, NIOSH and CDC have taken steps to increase the supply of available certified respirators by one, supporting existing NIOSH respirator approval holders to increase their ongoing production, two, quickly evaluating new domestic respirator applications for approval, three, providing up-to-date guidance, especially with regard to respirators made by non-U.S. manufacturers, and four, tripling respirator approval decisions. Yeah, I, I to expand the range of respirators available to healthcare workers, NIOSH works with FDA on its emergency use authorizations, which can significantly expand the inventory of respirators available for use in healthcare settings by one, permitting the use of powered air purifying respirators, or PAPRs, elastomeric respirators, and other NIOSH-approved filtering face piece respirators besides the N95 that had not been previously cleared by FDA for use in healthcare settings. Second, permitting the use of stockpiled respirators that had exceeded their rated shelf life. Three, permitting the use of certain respirators from foreign countries approved under the performance standards in those countries. And four, permitting the reuse of certain decontaminated filtering face piece respirators. Second, field survey support for state health departments. NIOSH deployed staff to 34 states uh, uh, and uh, 18 uh, poultry, 11 beef, and five uh, uh, poultry processing uh, 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 workplaces representing 15 uh, separate companies. Uh, the number of cases in, of COVID-19 in meat processing is significant. Uh, NIOSH has reviewed plant facilities, processes, operations, CDC's epidemiologists and partners from state and local health departments, evaluated plant and community infection control plans uh, through uh, various methodologies. A typical uh, site visit examines multiple features of the plant's operations. Third, guidance. NIOSH has, through the Emergency Operations Center at CDC, worked with our partner agencies, including OSHA, the Department of Agriculture, and the Department of Transportation to produce numerous guidance documents and fact sheets for employers and workers in various industries and occupations. For example, CDC and OSHA have co-authored interim guidance for the meat and poultry packing industry and interim guidance for manufacturing workers and employers. Thank you again for the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much. I think we're, we're going to go vote and then come right back. do that? They call for votes, so we're going to go and vote in vote rotations until we get um, further information. Uh, I'm on that first rotation. So, Mr. Scott, will you? Well, that's what I was trying to do, get everybody to vote.
Um, we apologize. We're hoping to go vote all at the same time, but apparently that's um, we don't have permission to do that yet. Um, first uh, question will be the gentleman from California, Mr. Takano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you, Chairman, uh, Chairwoman Adams, for uh, organizing this uh, critical hearing on the need to protect uh, workers from coronavirus. The role of the Occupational Safety and Health Administration is to, quote, ensure safe and healthful working conditions for working men and women by setting and enforcing standards, end quote. During this current pandemic, where nearly 1.5 million people have been infected with COVID-19, and nearly 100,000 people in this country have died, OSHA has completely abandoned its responsibilities and is not holding up to its mission. The General Duty Clause of the Occupational Safety and Health Act requires employers to provide employees with, quote, a workplace free from recognized hazards likely to cause death or serious physical harm, end quote. And based on my review of the nearly 5,000 COVID-19 related complaints filed by workers, it is evident that many employers are not making good faith efforts to protect their workers. Ms. Sweat, is OSHA prepared to conduct mandatory on-site inspections in response to worker complaints that allege serious health violations, not just for those complaints that result in a fatality? Yes, yeah, so OSHA has been working proactively since the beginning of February to address the COVID-19 hazard. We have, as you said, over 5,000 complaints, and our inspectors are investigating all of them, uh, where they are getting information from employers that is not um, adequate. They are opening investigations. And so, yes, the agency has been doing its job um, since the beginning of this pandemic. Do you have enough inspectors to be able to, uh, to, be able to do this in a timely manner? Uh, I think folks know that we've been actively trying to hire investigators since August of 2017. Um, we are appreciative of Congress providing us more um, funding so that we can hire 50 this year. Until March of this year, we were in an unprecedented competition with the private sector to find and hire adequate workers. This is a highly skilled profession and um, we have been trying to get folks to come in and serve the um, mission of the agency. It's been something that's a priority of mine since I started in July of 2017, uh, but it was very challenging with record low unemployment numbers to get people to come in with the skills that we need. So yes, we are pursuing more inspectors. Ms. Sweat, how many, if, if I may, how many, excuse me, how, how, many, how many workers do you need and how many uh, positions remain unfilled? Well, we have 50 that are funded by Congress this year that we're trying to fill. Even in the midst of this pandemic, we are actively recruiting um, folks to come and work for us and we are seeing results. So um, we will work as hard as we can and as diligently as possible to hire those folks and get them through our process and get more people to have more boots on the ground. Uh, Ms. White, as the lead agency, how will OSHA work to enforce national policies uh, for each agency uh, that you work with and make sure rules are implied and followed uniformly from facility to facility? Well, I, I think um, the question is about our engagement with our federal partners. Yes. And, um, you know, our um, folks are on about 10 federal task forces related to COVID specifically. We are engaged with um, NIOSH and the CDC to write this guidance, these guidance documents that you've seen. Um, the most important that we've issued lately is the meatpacking guidance. We issued construction on Monday. Uh, we're working on more as we identify industries that need to understand uh, what we are requiring. And uh, we will continue to do that uh, to the best of our ability. Uh, Ms. Swat, just recently, uh, I, uh, I'm looking at the clock and I just don't know. Yeah, it was never set, so it just wouldn't. Okay, all right. Um, you know, rather than enforcing OSHA's rule, uh, the Trump administration plan for opening up America again attempts to shift workplace safety preparedness to the states by highlighting the state's responsibility for the health and safety of workers in critical industries. Ms. Sweat, was OSHA consulted in preparing this plan? Uh, the, all of those plans go through uh, clearance, and I would say that 
Um, they may be talking about the state and local health authorities, but you know, OSHA is in approximately 26 states, and then there's 22 states with state but plans. Specifically, so, on the Trump administration's plan to open up on America again, uh, was OSHA consulted in preparing this plan? I do believe that OSHA participated in the clearance plan, yes. You don't know for sure? Um, I do believe that we did, yes. Does this, effectively, does this approach effectively sideline OSHA's uh, uh, sideline OSHA in its role uh, for protecting workers? No, I do not believe it does. Uh, even though it highlights the state's responsibilities, I mean, it, it does not de-emphasize OSHA? I do not think so. Um, is this plan consistent with the OSHA Act? Um, as I said, federal OSHA exists in specific states and then there are state plans um, of which we provide grant money to. So where we are um, in jurisdiction, we will be in enforcement mode and we will be doing our job. I do not believe that that plan changes our obligations. Thank you. I need a lot. I can come work the clock. <laughs> Gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I mean, thank you again, both of you, for being here. I know you're very busy. Ms. Sweat, you heard me recite the testimony of one of your predecessors during the Obama administration. And so I want to ask you a simple question. How is OSHA's COVID-19 response similar or different from the approach taken by the Obama administration during the H1N1 pandemic? We have followed the H1N1 pandemic um, strategy uh, almost to the T. Uh, it's been very important for us to get the message out. We started as early as January with the safety and health topics page. We provided general guidance um, for all industries so that they could plan to um, protect their workers. And as the pandemic has um, spread, we have provided industry guidance for very specific industries. And um, I think we are doing what we are supposed to do, enforcement, compliance assistance, and um, training and education of everyone that will come to us and work with us on our, our guidance. And um, I, I don't think that we've diverted from what the plan was with H1N1. Can you elaborate on how OSHA has historically responded to emergency, emerging workplace hazards and why the agency has used compliance initiatives coupled with enforcement of existing standards, including the OSHA Act's general duty clause as effective measures to respond quickly during a pandemic? Um, thank you. I would like to say that we respond to a lot of different issues and have since I started in July of 2017. Um, natural disasters, hurricanes, typically in those situations we suspend enforcement. In this instance, we proactively determined that we would stay in enforcement mode and we would use all the enforcement tools available to us. One of those is the um, investigation for complaints. Um, as we've noted, we've received over 5,000 complaints. And the approach that we've taken, and this gets us into the employer almost immediately, puts them on notice that someone has said there is a problem and that we are following up. It is one of the fastest ways to achieve resolution in this situation to get the worker on notice, or the employer on notice and the worker out of the hazard. Thank you. Dr. Howard, what resources has NOSH developed to educate employers and workers on how best to keep workplaces safe? And do you anticipate that NOSH will continue to update this information? Well, let me take the second question. The answer is definitely yes. Uh, our guidance uh, changes rapidly. And I always tell people, don't print out uh, CDC guidance from your printer because it may be out of date the next time you go to, uh, to the website. <laughs> Uh, this is a rapidly evolving situation, uh, so our guidance changes uh, pretty much uh, every week and sometimes every day. Um, the, the first question, uh, we do a lot of educational guidance with regard to both these congregate working situations which are at highest risk, uh, such as a nursing home, uh, a meatpacking plant, uh, uh, situations in which congregate commerce occurs, where you have a worker and a customer close together. So we're, we are doing a lot to educate the worker and the employer on these situations. Good. So, uh, Ms. Welt, let me go back to you for a second. We're beginning to see a lot of businesses reopen, which I want to say I think is a very good thing. 
So how does OSHA plan to engage with employers and workers, as Dr. Howard said, to ensure successful workplace safety outcomes? We're going to continue providing guidance, and as folks look to reopen, uh, we will be working, or we are actually working on um, reopening guidance so that when um, employers are looking at what they're going to do to protect their workers, we can explain how that intersects with our existing standards and regulations and what they need to do in order to be in compliance as they go forward. But the existing guidance that we have, um, that we've worked with NIOSH and others, um, really does provide a, a very productive roadmap for what employers should be doing as they look to reopen their businesses. And Dr. Howard, you, you know, I think you kind of alluded to this earlier, let me go back to you about this, but CDC and all the rest of us are learning about this disease, like literally something new every day. So as you issue new guidance, you're taking into account what CDC and other people are telling you, but as you said earlier, it's happening so rapidly, you don't even, don't even print it out. You just put it on, you know you're going to have to change it the next day. How difficult does that make it for both of you to actually try to come up with a, quote, standard as opposed to guidance? I think it's very difficult. Uh, guidance is, as you mentioned, an easier pathway uh, based on the best professional judgment and hopefully the best science uh, that we have. And it can be easily done, although the review process is, is long and detailed, as it should be. Uh, but when we learn something new, that guidance can be changed almost instantaneously. Uh, and the case uh, of, of the meatpacking guidance, which we uh, and OSHA put together, one of the big issues now is establishment level testing. Well, that's not really something that we put in the current edition of the guidance, but we're beginning to think more seriously about how you do that, because as we know, many meatpacking processing plants are doing that kind of testing. So we're beginning to think about that. So in the next iteration of our guidance, we may have more information about testing. Good. Thank you. And I yield back. Thank you. The uh, gentlelady from Georgia, Ms. McBeth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for convening this um, hearing this morning. Thank you to both of our witnesses. We appreciate you being here. Over the last three months, we have watched as the COVID-19 coronavirus has made its devastating impact on this nation. Uh, 100,000 Americans have died from this disease, and the magnitude of loss is simply staggering. For those that we've lost and the millions of Americans who've lost someone, we continue to mourn. In this time of crisis, we've seen time and time again that everyday heroes simply live among us and from every part of our communities. Frontline healthcare providers working around the clock to treat our families, first responders, grocery store workers, essential employees and del delivery workers have all answered the call to ensure that all Americans can have access to vital services and goods during this period. We have seen outbreaks in meatpacking plants, COVID wards filled with healthcare workers and essential employees, and yet, there is no infectious disease standard for these workers. My colleagues and I are committed to strengthening protections for these workers, and I was very pleased to join Chairman Scott and other committee members as an original co-sponsor of the COVID-19 Every Worker Protection Act. This bill strengthens OSHA protections by creating an emergency temporary standard for frontline workers while considering the constraints that have been placed on employers during this crisis. However, this legislation is not necessary for OSHA to act. Ms. Scott, my, Ms. Sweat, my, my question is for you. As you know, the following H1N1 pandemic, OSHA began work in earnest uh, on infectious disease standards. Yet three and a half years into this administration and 100,000 American deaths into this pandemic, please explain why the OSHA infectious disease standard is still languishing on the long-term regulatory agenda. What I can explain is that OSHA has prioritized the protection of healthcare workers. We did that very early on. If you look at um, the guidance and the information that we sent out, we're very concerned about access to respirators for these individuals, and we issued no less than five enforcement guidance documents to ensure that our frontline healthcare workers were 
um, given the best access to respirators that they could have. And um, I would note that it languished on the regulatory agenda of the previous administration for eight years. Now, if the permanent standard had been put into effect, would it have pro provided OSHA with additional tools to deal with the pandemic? OSHA is using its existing tools to address the concerns that are related to healthcare workers and all workers with this pandemic. But does OSHA intend to resume work on this standard, on the standards that you're talking about? I think we're getting very close to this is in litigation, and I really cannot comment further. So then, all right, so then basically, I see that you're still moving forward full, full steam ahead with OSHA's tree care standard. Is that really a good way to be spending your time during this unprecedented crisis? Our folks were able to multitask and we were able to complete that standard. Tree care work is very dangerous work and it is an important standard for us to address. That has been languishing on the regulatory agenda for 20 years. Well, it's apparent that you would have, uh, have more resources if you had not cut OSHA's standards by 10% in 2017. So given the crisis, would you consider a significant increase in OSHA's regulatory budget helpful to you? I think that this Congress has increased our budget and we will use those dollars wisely. My last question, when is your next plan of action for the, that standard and when do you expect to have a proposed rule? Can you give us a, a date or a month or time? I'm sorry, for which standard? For your, the proposed standards that you're already using. Um, the regulatory agenda it speaks for itself. Okay, thank you, I have no further questions. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, yield now to the young lady from North Carolina, uh, Ranking Member of Education and Labor, Dr. Fox. You recognize. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses for being here today. Ms. Sweats, very nice to see you again. Dr. Howard, very nice to see you all again. Uh, Ms. Sweat, on March 5, 2020, six days before the World Health Organization, classified COVID-19 as a pandemic. Committee Democrats sent a letter to Secretary of Labor Scalia demanding that OSHA immediately issue an emergency temporary standard for COVID-19. Since March 5th, a great deal has changed in both the scientific understanding of COVID-19 and the application of appropriate and effective safety protocols in combating workplace exposure to the coronavirus. Can you explain further the rationale behind the detailed workplace safety guidance of OSHA, that the, behind the detailed workplace safety guidance OSHA has issued to date, and whether this approach has been effective? Um, I do believe that this approach has been effective. We started with our general industry guidance. We provided as much information as we had available, and um, we have since brought on more um, industry-specific guidance. We have manufacturing, construction, um, meat processing. It's been a, a way for us to, as we learn more about the virus and spread, for us to really dig into these specific places and um, put out better um, guidance for employers. And then we've also managed to take these um, guidance documents and break them into usable pieces for workers. And uh, we've translated almost everything that we have into Spanish. And um, some of our materials is on about 12 other languages. Thank you. Ms. Sweat, committee Democrats and their union allies have been circulating an untruthful talking point, which has been echoed in various media outlets, including the Washington Post that OSHA has been, quote, missing in action, end quote, when it comes to protecting workers from COVID-19. Do you believe the administration's critics and their media allies undermine workplace safety when they misleadingly claim that OSHA is neglecting its responsibilities, that employers are willfully ignoring safety in their workplaces, and that workers have few, if any, protections under the law? Dr. Fox, thank you very much for highlighting this. I felt so strongly about the accusations that I um, wrote a letter to the Washington Post refuting those assertions, and they printed it. I'm happy to provide that for the record. I think it would be useful if we put that into the record. Um, I, I want to add to that that 
uh, one of our colleagues earlier said that uh, that the absence of the uh, rules that the Democrats want means that there's nobody out there protecting the health and safety of workers. It is an abysmal misunderstanding of how the private workplace operates, and that is that every employer wants his or her workers kept safe. They are their most valuable assets. And, and we hear that accusation over and over and over on this committee. And again, it's very clear that they have no concept of what happens in the private working sector. Um, Dr. Howard, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, NIOSH and the CDC have constantly updated their guidance as the outbreak has developed and as more is learned about the coronavirus. What process does NIOSH use to update or change its recommendations, and what factors does the agency take into account when considering updates to its guidance? Well, thank you very much for that question. Um, you know, there is a lot of our guidance, uh, both uh, NIOSH guidance as well as CDC guidance coming from our Emergency Operations Center. In fact, if I printed it all out, there would be a stack very high here. And the primary drivers for guidance uh, are stakeholder need, perceived uh, issues related to the virus itself, uh, and what we're seeing as the situation evolves. So it is a very responsive type process to what's happening on the ground. Uh, so uh, I would sum up by saying that it's probably the most responsive uh, guidance machinery that I've ever seen at CDC. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for what you're doing, what you and your colleagues are doing, because we know you are focused on the health and safety of American workers. Uh, and Ms. Sweat, I appreciate you emphasizing that in your uh, first comments. Now, I have another question for you. On April 8th, OSHA issued a statement reminding employers that it is illegal to retaliate against workers because they report unsafe and unhealthful working conditions during the coronavirus pandemic. What protections do workers have under the OSHA Act against unlawful retaliation, and how is the agency responding to whistleblower complaints during the pandemic? Thank you, Dr. Fox. This is very important work at the agency. And we have 23 whistleblower statutes that we're in charge of. Uh, what we see with the COVID-19 is mostly 11C, which is in the Occupational Safety and Health Act. Um, what I would like to say is that the agency and its um, whistleblower investigators have already achieved reinstatement of workers. They have um, seen uh, letters of reprimand removed, um, just based on the phone call as we initiate the investigation. And in fact, we have reports of businesses understanding and changing their um, structure so that they are not retaliating and that they are encouraging um, the reporting of safety and health concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, very you very Dr. Much. Fox. Thank you very much, Dr. Fox. I want to um, recognize uh, now Ms. Jalapal. Jalapal, uh, unmute. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay and very much appreciate this yes, hearing. I think this is a very important hearing uh, and I appreciate the witnesses. We are in an unprecedented time. We have lost over 100,000 American lives. That is almost more than we lost during the Vietnam, uh, during World War I, and it is more than all of the wars combined since World War II. So I think what we're talking about is something extremely unprecedented um, that requires our complete attention and devotion. What happens when an agency fails the people it's supposed to protect? People suffer and people die. People like Tyson Fresh Meats beef, beef packaging worker, Guadalupe Oliveira, who loved to travel to national parks with his wife, Amazon warehouse worker Harry Santoso, who died on his 27th wedding anniversary, 28-year-old mental health counselor James Simpson, whose own experiences in foster care led him to work as a counselor for troubled teens, and transit worker and father of three, Scott Ryan, who coached his kids in baseball and wrestling. These workers lost their lives to COVID-19 after faithfully serving their communities during this pandemic. The loss of these workers' lives is an incredible tragedy and a preventable one. 
OSHA is a division of the U.S. Department of Labor and is charged with that important responsibility of protecting workers. And I'm glad to have a representative of OSHA here today to better understand what you've been doing to protect workers during this pandemic. So, Ms. Sweat, um, as the principal deputy assistant secretary of OSHA, how many workers in the United States have contracted COVID-19 in the workplace? Um, we have... Um we have reports of um, worker injury related to COVID-19. And uh, what we do instead have, and better statistics, are the fact that we have 5,000 um, COVID complaints right now. And our agency is working uh, expeditiously, expeditiously, excuse me, to close those complaints um, and figure out how to provide employers and workers the best information available to protect themselves. So, Ms. Sweat, are you saying that the that OSHA, which is the agency charged with protecting workers, is not tracking COVID-19 infections in the workplace? I mean, the UK, for example, has been carefully tracking COVID-19 related deaths by occupation. Um, are, are you not tracking this? Are you incapable of tracking COVID-19 infections in the workplace separate from the complaints? Um, I, I would, I could go into a description of record keeping and the employer's responsibility <laughs> under record keeping, but I think um, Dr. Howard might be the best person to talk about um, the way that COVID-19 is tracked. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, yes, at CDC, as I mentioned in my testimony, um, we have been getting better at tracking occupation and industry for COVID-19 cases. Uh, we have a new case report form that uh, we are hoping that the states will start using. We asked them to start using it on the 15th of May, in which there are specific uh, fields that can be filled out that De delineate what the occupation and industry of that worker is. We have done more in the area of surveillance for healthcare worker occupation, and we're beginning to do that for meat, uh, poultry, and chicken processing workers also. Uh, we have um, uh, received uh, funding from from the Congress recently to modernize uh, data collection at CDC uh, for these types of things, and I'm happy to go into more detail on that. Right. Th thank you, Mr. Howard. I, I guess, you know, what I would say is May 15th is pretty late for beginning to track uh, deaths and, and occupational deaths um, and cases. Uh, let me go back to to uh, Ms. Sweat, isn't it true that OSHA revised its previous enforcement policy for recording cases of coronavirus, stating that under OSHA's record keeping requirements, coronavirus is a recordable illness and employers are responsible for recording cases of coronavirus? And also, isn't it true that OSHA only revised this data collection policy um, on incidents of COVID-19 in the workplace on May 19th, more than two months after President Trump declared a state of emergency? So our first record keeping guidance um, or enforcement document really wanted uh, our folks to, oh, sorry for the feedback, um, focus on healthcare workers and for other employers to look at hygiene practices. And um, so there was never a rescission, if you will, of our requirement to put uh, record keeping and COVID related record keeping on their logs. As uh, America looks to reopen, we issued a new guidance document that re emphasizes the employer's obligation to examine COVID 19 work relatedness and put that on their OSHA logs. Thank you very much. Your time's up. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chair. You're back. Thank you, Mr. Jolicon. Let me now recognize the gentleman from uh, North Carolina, Mr. Walker. Thank you, Madam Chair. There's been a lot of discussion today from my colleagues across the aisle pointing to an emergency stand, temporary standard as being the only solution to guarantee workplace protections, which completely overlooks the significant burden that would be placed on small businesses that are already struggling, as most of the country can see. Small businesses in my district and across America have been shattered due to the extended closures because of COVID-19. I speak to small businesses literally every day who are hanging or ha trying to hang in there to make tough decisions just to keep their doors open. 
Uh, imposing restrictive and duplicative re regulations would simply create additional barriers. My question, Ms. Sweat, if I could start with you. You mentioned in your testimony that important work OSHA, the important work OSHA is doing in conjunction with the CDC to issue industry-specific guidance to ensure worker safety. Just yesterday, when I was looking through the CDC website, I was very encouraged to find detailed guidance for various industries ranging from the retail to the airline industry. Can you expand on why it is important to issue guidance tailored to address the unique challenges of each industry as opposed to a one-size-fits-all regulation covering all industry? Thank you, Congressman. Yes, um, I think it's very important that we're able to take our general industry guidance and then um, put it into these specific industries because they are different. Construction can be outside and inside. Manufacturing is mostly inside. So there's a variety of social distancing issues that um, folks face. And if I can comment briefly on the small business aspect of um, your question, we have an on-site consultation program that is available in all 50 states for small businesses to um, find a person who can help them implement safety and health. And there's a firewall between um, the, OSHA, the OSHA enforcement side of the house. And we've seen dramatic improvement and results from small businesses utilizing our on-site consultation program. Yeah, and uh, using the right title, Dr. Howard, if I could ask you something, how often does the CDC and OSHA receive new data on COVID-19 given the con constantly changing information. Uh, so hold that one question. Let me say the second part is, what is the likelihood that a regulation published as soon as tomorrow would be applicable or relevant even four to six weeks from now? Well, uh, regarding the first question, you know, as I said, this is a highly evolving situation and we get new data uh, every day, not only from, uh, from, from the surveillance system that we have in place and the ones that we're developing, but also from a number of these industries that you're talking about. I can't speak to the issue of regulation because CDC does not do regulation. Yeah, I want to swing that part of it back over to Ms. Sweat. you have anything to weigh in on the question? Um, no, I just would agree with Dr. Howard that this is rapidly evolving and our folks are tracking this. They're working 24-7 uh, to provide the best information available. Under the OSHA Act, uh, OSHA Act, once an ETS has been issued, it must be replaced with a permanent standard. I believe the timeline is within six months using the customary rulemaking process, which includes uh, gathering stakeholder input through public comment as well as hearings. Ms. Wett, can you tell me what is the average amount of time it takes to gather the necessary data and evidence to publish a permanent standard? According to a GAO report, um, OSHA takes eight to 15 years to promulgate a new standard. So would you say that an abbreviated rulemaking process would require additional resources that could be used to enforce existing guidelines to protect workers in order to publish the rule within the six month time frame? Um, I do think that uh, we are working around the clock to provide the information available, uh, to make information available and work um, towards uh, protecting workers. And the other piece of the rulemaking issue is um, we do find that it's very important to get the most um, and robust comments during our rulemaking process. Well, I, I think it's uh, clear for all of us that this is still a learning process. We want to be diligent, but I would hope that we can all agree that OSHA and the CDC resources are best spent on assisting American workers and businesses maintaining safe workplaces rather than complying with more bureaucratic demands. With that, I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Um, let me yield to the general aide from Pennsylvania as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to address some comments by my colleague across the aisle, Mr. Byrne. The problem with silencing witnesses on issues before this and other committees is that we seem to be mired in lawsuits brought by both sides of the aisle which could basically bring a halt to the very important work done by these committees. Also, it's usually on advice of counsel that a witness is instructed not to speak on a matter in litigation. This process just allows an administration witness to pick and choose which question she's willing to answer. I'd further like to comment on Mr. Burns' remarks. Um, H1N1 killed fewer than 13,000 people in a year. COVID has killed 100,000 in four months. To say that we should not have a standard on the basis of H1N1 is also 
a false comparator. With that, Dr. Howard, I have a question for you. A large survey by the American Nurses Association indicates that where facilities are reusing and decontaminating respirators, 54% of nurses believe if it is unsafe to use a decontaminated respirator N95 mask. A different survey by the National Nurses United found that a quarter, 25% of respondents, had to reuse a so-called decontaminated respirator with confirmed COVID-19 patients. Is there solid evidence that decontaminated N95 respirator masks are safe for healthcare workers to use? And are decontaminated respirator masks as protective as new ones in preventing infection? Thank you for that for question. Uh, I'm aware of those surveys and I understand them being a healthcare worker myself. I think one of the issues I'd like to emphasize at the, at the, at the get-go is that decontamination of an N95 respirator is not the first step in optimizing the use of respirators for healthcare workers. It is literally the last step. Every other uh, type of respirator that we recommend in healthcare, a PAPR, an elastomeric, et cetera, be used before you decide to decontaminate your supply of N95s. The science about decontamination is relatively new, and I mean very new. Manufacturers would take exception to the idea of decontaminating an N95. Um, what we recommend uh, in, in terms of a hospital that, that is planning to do this is to check with the manufacturer. There are over 500 models of the N95, and each of them are constructed a little differently out of different material, and they have different uh, configurations, and it's important that you identify with the manufacturer what do you think is going to happen to this particular model that we're using if we use vaporous hydrogen peroxide as a a decontamination method. So again, it's the last step in the hierarchy of controls. PPE is always the last step. And amongst PPE optimization procedures, it is literally the last step. So take it very carefully, check with the manufacturer, and check with the companies that are planning to decontaminate your respirator. Have they done testing? One, does the respirator survive, the elastic bands, et cetera? And two, does it kill the virus? Thank you very much for that very complete answer. You've a, uh, answered my other questions that I was going to ask you. Um, Ms. Sweat, in your March 19th letter to Chairman Scott and Representative Adams, you stated that an emergency temporary standard is not needed to protect healthcare workers or other workers because the healthcare industry fully understands the gravity of the situation and is taking the appropriate step to pr steps to protect its workers. But we know that close to 62,000 healthcare workers have been infected with COVID-19, and 291 are dead as of last count. I suspect that some hospitals are safer than others. Would you agree with me on that for workers? You don't, okay, you, you need to turn on your mic, but yeah. you, you, you don't have an opinion one way or the other. I know that we have two excellent healthcare institutions in my Pennsylvania district that have taken worker safety very, very seriously. On the other hand, we have another hospital where employees have reached out to me with deep concerns about their lack of PPE, the need to reuse uh, surgical masks, the paper masks like the one I'm wearing now over and over again. Wouldn't an OSHA standard ensure that all of our healthcare workers be kept safe while, while caring for the rest of us? Well, I think if you're talking about respirators, respiratory protection is already required. And so it really becomes um, access to respirators. And I think um, Dr. Howard could talk to um, some of the things that they're doing related to respiratory protection. But what we did early on was address the need um, to slow the burn rate. One of the requirements in our respirator standard is an annual fit test. We ensured that um, the fit test could occur while still protecting workers and not destroying the respirator, which is what the annual fit test would require otherwise. And so we've been very concerned about that since day one, and we've issued five guidance documents related to respirators and their use in order Excuse to- Excuse me, I, I, would the supply. I would note that this is not responsive to the question I asked, but with that, we are out of time. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, Ms. Wild. Um, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Klein, you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I thank the witnesses for being here today. Um, 
Dr. Howard, you mentioned that at NIOSH you've significantly increased work hours in order to more than triple the rate of respirator approval and denial decisions from 30 to over 100 decisions per month. That is a significant uh, increase, and I appreciate the steps you're taking to expand your workload during this time. And Ms. Sweat, thank you for outlining how OSHA has been responding to this virus and how frequently you're issuing guidance. It's imperative during a time like this that OSHA is able to remain responsive to the new discoveries through the ability to revise guidance. It's clear that OSHA is working hard to ensure employees are protected and that their guidance is accessible through things like the COVID-19 tip of the day and a top 10 list of actions employers and workers can take to prevent COVID-19 infection. And I ask Ms. Sweat, uh, back on April 16th, OSHA issued an interim enforcement policy advising the agency's compliance, safety, and health officers to evaluate an employer's good faith efforts to comply with safety and health standards during the coronavirus pandemic. Can you elaborate on this policy, including what kinds of factors OSHA will consider when evaluating an employer's efforts? and how employers should document these efforts to comply? Yes, thank you very much for the question. Um, that was really focused on a lot of the medical uh, removal issues and medical um, requirements in our existing standards. Um, and a lot of um, the people who were providing these services to workers were no longer able to do that because of shelter in place issues. And so spirometry, audiometry, those things were not going to be available to the um, employer. So as they look to reopen and they look to reschedule that, um, when, if and when an OSHA inspector comes on site, they need to explain what their plan is going forward to catch up on the um, requirements that they have to protect their workers under these standards. And as OSHA continues to revise its guidance based on the newest information surrounding coronavirus, how are you working to inform businesses about these changes? And moving forward, will OSHA consider industry-specific webinars and offer opportunities for industry to ask direct questions? Um, thank you very much for the question. We have had a very active um, engagement um, with the unions and with stakeholders. Uh, our folks have done a variety of webinars. Our compliance assistance individuals talk about almost 4,000 um, outreach activities that they've already done in the last um, two or three months. So we are actively engaged on all fronts of what the agency does. And as we continue our work through the summer and into the fall, our folks will be available and we will give the best information that we can. I think one of the um, most important things that we can see immediately is the dramatic increase to um, the number of people who visited our website to look at our guidance documents. And so I think people are really, truly looking for answers. Thank you. Dr. Howard, the FDA issued an emergency use authorization permitting the use of certain respirators certified under other, under other country safety standards during the pandemic. How is uh, NIOSH working with the FDA to ensure the efficacy of these respirators? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, NIOSH works very closely with the center at FDA that is responsible for approving respirators. And we look with FDA to the standards that that particular manufacturer in that country are using. There are some international standards that the EU has, for instance, that many Chinese manufacturers use. So we, we work with FDA to figure out which of the KN95s, they're called, coming from China, for instance, uh, meet uh, the, sta the international standards, and then they're, they're included on the FDA's EUA. And you mentioned this earlier, but would you have the opportunity to expand on it a little bit? Beyond the issuance of formal guidance, what additional resources has NIOSH created for employers and workers to educate themselves about how to prevent COVID-19 in the workplace? Well, one of the things that we do, we do field uh, technical assistance visits with other centers at CDC. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we've done uh, 34 sites uh, for beef, pork, and chicken processing. Uh, and we've had excellent cooperation uh, from the plant operators and from the companies involved, uh, even though they're dealing with a very difficult uh, situation. Uh, as you know, uh, a uh, meat processing plant is a very labor-intensive workplace. And our recommendations are fundamental on the issue of keeping people apart. That is extremely difficult to do in a very labor-intensive operation like meat processing. Uh, so, so those field investigations have been educational for us, 
and they have been educational also for the plant operator and the companies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to now recognize the general lady from Michigan. Um, Ms. Stevens, you recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I join my colleagues in mourning the staggering loss of uh, 100,000 Americans to this wretched disease. Um, Ms. Sweat, it's uh, known that you oversee an agency with a budget of $552 million, is that correct? And you oversee about 2,300 employees? About 2,000, yes, ma'am. Okay. Great, and are you currently working from home? Um, no. You're going in every day, and how many, um, I guess, how many calls or, or meetings do you take, take a day? I have to imagine it's, it's, it's quite a few. Uh, yes. And, and are, are most of them um, just uh, meetings that have been scheduled? Are they kind of uh, reactive meetings? Or are there uh, specific calls or, uh, uh, you know, outreach that you are doing that, that, that is sort of unprompted? Uh, I think my schedule is a combination of um, activities related to, we have a weekly meeting with all of our senior staff and regional administrators. Um, I meet weekly uh, with the directorate heads as we're able to do that. Um, have you spoken to um, any uh, essential workers? Have you, have you picked up the, the phone and, and called any or... Any, any employers uh, that are uh, deemed essential during your time? I, I know as a member of Congress, it, it was sort of unprompted, but the, the first call I, I made when this pandemic was declared was to our grocery stores because I just thought, holy smokes, you're now all of a sudden a, an essential service uh, just almost overnight. Uh, how are you getting prepared? Have, have you made any calls like that? Yes, we've had calls with the unions, we've had calls with stakeholders, we've performed webinars. I've personally done these things myself, yeah. as has the staff. And, um, you know, we continue our- engagement. You have an outreach office, right? You, you, you do, you have an external affairs outreach office. Well, we have a communications office, but we also have a directorate of compliance and state programs. We've had um, meet, uh, weekly, every other week- I'd invite, invite you any time, ma'am, excuse me. I just invite you any time to, to call the um, incredible grocers in, in Michigan. We. Uh, you know, and nursing homes for that matter. I mean, these, these hardworking individuals every single day, I, I, I know they'd absolutely um, welcome a phone call from you uh, at, 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 at any time. And um, doc, Dr. Howard, uh, thank you so much for, for your expertise uh, uh, and your, your testimony today. I think last month, uh, you, you, you might have seen, I introduced legislation to create an interagency task force that would bring together experts from across our government to establish um, uh, the scientifically based guidance and recommendations to, to, to our industries, right? And I, I heard you in one of the previous responses that you, uh, you see the CDC changing almost on a weekly basis. How, how is that being communicated and how are you with NIOSH working on an interagency basis to communicate these changing science-based facts that are coming out about coronavirus? Well, our chief uh, method of communication is obviously through uh, the CDC website uh, on coronavirus. Uh, the interaction with other federal agencies are chiefly uh, uh, OSHA, the Department of Agriculture, which we've had a much closer relationship with lately in the Food uh, uh, Safety in Inspection Service, FSIS, as well as the Department of Transportation on airline, the FAA, for instance. So wherever the particular workplace or industry is, we tend to reach out to that particular federal agencies, that, that the often regulators that are responsible in that area, the stakeholders, the unions involved, and the employer associations that service that industry. Great, thank you, Dr. Howard. And Ms. Sweat, Michigan um, has been pretty hard hit, uh, and, and particularly in our nursing homes uh, by this coronavirus pandemic. Um, I've heard complaints, as you were citing, from, from businesses um, in my district that have found uh, OSHA's guidance sometimes confusing and vague. So, for example, on page 10, and I've read this report several times on the guidance on preparing workplaces for COVID-19, uh, on page 10, you, you state that um, employers should provide a face mask if feasible and available and ask a person to wear it if tolerated. Why did OSHA uh, issue guidance like this? 
And why not just clearly state that masks can prevent the spread of COVID-19 when they're worn by workers? Uh, I would um, point out that this was written in early March, and so um, the issue and evolving um, thought process around face masks may have changed. Um, but I do think that Dr. Howard can give you the more scientific um, issues around the use of face masks. Our concern here is um, often around respiratory protection and the use of respirators. Well, I'm, with that, I'm out of time, but uh, we, we thank our, our, our committee chair for uh, holding today's hearing, and we'll follow up on questions for the record. Thank you, Ms. Stevens. Thank, uh, thank you, Ms. Sweat. Uh, I'm going to, to um, uh, recognize myself now. Uh, for my questions, I did have to leave to go vote. Ms. Ms. Sweat, uh, do you think that COVID-19 uh, presents a grave danger to workers? I think that you're asking questions around the emergency temporary standard, and I can't answer that. Well, I'm not. I'm, I'm simply asking, is COVID-19, in your opinion, does it present a grave danger to workers, yes or no? I think that you're asking a question around the emergency oh, okay, temporary standard. Okay, you're not going to answer that. All right. Uh, Ms. Sweat, at least... 260 healthcare workers have already died of COVID-19. Tens of thousands have been infected. Is COVID-19 a grave danger to healthcare workers? Can you give me a yes or no? Madam Chair, what I will tell you is that OSHA has prioritized healthcare workers and identified the issue of respirators since the very beginning of this pandemic. As I've said before, we issued five guidance documents in an attempt to um, ensure that the burn rate on respirators did not impact these workers. Okay, but is it a grave danger? Yes or no? You can't say Madam yes Madam Chair, or no, I'm not going you, to answer okay. yes or no All right, no let, me, let me move on. I don't want to use up my time like that. Dr. Howard, um, would you try to answer yes or no for me, please? Do you think that COVID-19 presents a grave danger to workers? Yes, I do. All right. Um, let me uh, ask you, Dr. Howard, um, Let's uh, focus for a moment on, on the meatpacking uh, workers. Um, is COVID-19, in your opinion, a grave danger for meatpacking workers? Yes, I do. What about healthcare workers? Yes, I do. All right. Uh, Ms. Sweat, can you answer me honestly? If you were a worker in a meat processing plant or, or a nursing home, would you feel safer knowing that there was an enforceable OSHA standard and the agency stood ready to issue citations if safe working standards were being violated? Or would you feel safer knowing only that your employer just had to make a good faith effort to comply with voluntary guidance? What I can tell you is that the agency has focused on the meat processing industry. We have over 58 um, complaints or inspections active currently. And um, we have had daily phone calls with FSIS and um, Dr. Howard's office to address okay, the concerns Ms. around meat packing. Okay, and okay ma'am, I, I just want to know if you were a worker, uh, would you feel safer knowing that there was an enforceable standard, OSHA standard, and that the agency stood prepared to issue citations if safe working standards, uh, standards were being violated? Or would you feel safer knowing that the only thing your employer had to do was just to make a good faith effort? Can you, can you give me a yes or no? I think that I'm going to tell you that the agency is doing everything it can okay. related to this specific industry to provide okay. the best available yes, information. Yes, ma'am. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me move on. Um, so, Ms. Sweat, despite voluntary OSHA and uh, CDC guidance and the presidential executive orders, conditions in meat plants are, are getting worse. Now, you can say yes or no to that, but we've got all of the data comes on TV on the, every, every day we see that people are not only coming down with the disease, but that they're dying in these plants. And over the past month, according to the Washington Post, the number of infections tied to three of the country's biggest meat processors, Tyson Foods, Smithfield, and JBS, has gone from just over 3,000 to more than 11,000. Worker deaths have tripled, surging from 17 to at least 63. Now, given those numbers, would you say that your current strategy to ensure the safety of meat processing workers is working? I have to be very careful here because we do have open inspections and investigations in meatpacking facilities. 
So I think to answer your previous question and this no, one. No, I don't want you to answer the previous question. Okay, that one, yes, you can't give me a yes or no? The answer okay. is we yeah. stand ready if we find okay. violations thank, in our thank, enforcement thank investigations. Thank you, ma'am. I've got, I've got 50 seconds. Uh, if the only way to accomplish social distancing and meat processing is to slow down the production lines, we all should be willing to, to order the plants to do so. Would you order the plants to do so? Line speed is not within the jurisdiction right. of the agency, okay, but you. what they can do right. is in our guidance. Oh, okay. okay, that's fine. No, you wouldn't do it. Okay, and, and, and how many meat or poultry uh, process plants has OSHA done a physical inspection? How many physical inspections have you done? Within the last week, I believe it's 10. How many of those have been closed with no citations? I believe most of those are still pending. We have six months to complete our inspection. Okay, Dr. Howard, um, let me ask you, um, you, you said that uh, your testimony discussed the inspections of 34 meatpacking facilities in 12 states. Given the difficulty of redesigning meatpacking facilities in the short, would there be uh, far more effective to keep the virus out of the plant by requiring regular testing of workers for COVID-19? Well, this is, uh, testing is a complex uh, issue, and right now CDC doesn't have the establishment-wide guidance to give an employer who's interested in doing testing. Now, we're thinking about that. We have a lot of information that we're putting together, and we may be coming out uh, with more guidance on that issue, but right now, uh, we don't have enough information uh, to recommend establishment-wide. Now, those are my, asymptomatic my workers. Up, sir. I, I apologize. My time's up. I'm going to uh, have to now yield. Thank you, sir. Mr. Gossery of Kentucky, you are recognized, sir. Thank you. I thank the chair for the recognition. I appreciate it. Thanks for being here today. And um, my colleague from Michigan, Ms. Stevens, kind of talked about masks, and you said that was early in March. Things have changed, and I'm on Energy and Commerce Health, so we're in O and I, so we're following this, the information. So, so businesses out there are trying to make; they want their workers to be healthy and safe. They they want to be so. So, as things change, how is OSHA being proactive in making sure businesses know these changes? And how does proactive business? What's the best way? If I'm a business person in Bowling Green, Kentucky, trying to run a factory, what's the best way for me to know the best practices as these change every day? The updates. Well, we can update our website very quickly, obviously. So as our documents go up, we put them out on the website. We push them out in um, as many social media platforms as we have available. And we've seen a dramatic increase in the traffic to our website in addition to our newsletters. So I think employers and workers are seeking the best information possible. Um, a lot of our website also links to our federal partners, NIOSH and CDC. They also have an abundance of guidance based on what they're finding um, scientifically and medically. So we're working as quickly as possible to provide the best information to everyone. Okay, thank you. And then Dr. Howard, um, I know the FDA, because I have oversight of FDA, my other committee assignment, and did the emergency use order for the certain respirators that are certified in other countries for use? So how is your organization, NIOSH, working with FDA to ensure these are safe, their efficacy is there, and, and they're eligible to be used? Well, thank you for that question. As I mentioned, you know, we work very closely with FDA uh, on these emergency use authorizations that they publish. So our, our laboratory looks at the fit of the respirator and the filtration capability of the respirator. Those are the two main attributes of a respirator that we are uh, think are very important. A lot of these international respirators are made internationally in China, for instance, use ear loops. That doesn't give you the best fit, for instance. Uh, we have uh, to look at both the filtration efficiency, and we've tested some of those respirators. Uh, they don't come to the 95% of filtration efficiency that an N95 is. So we work with FDA. We get uh, uh, ex uh, states, for instance, are buying uh, respirators from China. They send it to us for evaluation. We perform the evaluation and give them the results. We also share that with FDA. FDA decides what models they're going to put on their EUA based on our testing. She's in the ear loops like this, and the rest of us the are The ear loops versus the ties behind the head. 
the, the two big issues for protecting the lungs from atmosphere is the fit, how tight the fit is so you don't get any leakage. And that is hard with the ear loops, okay? You get less fit. And the other is the material itself that f for filters the particles. So filtering and fit, those are the two big things that we test for. Yeah, Dr. Bouchon, who's a surgeon in, the, in another committee, we were talking, he says, yeah, people, because they're wearing the mask, feel like they can cough without having to cover up. And the problem is it comes right off the sides and it's probably, it, it creates a moral hazard sometimes. You have to be careful with that. So let me ask another question. I know that sometimes you get conflicting information businesses do and employers do, and, and not in this specifically. I cannot have any examples, but I know there are other areas that if you comply with one agency, you're violating another agency. I've seen that before. So, so Ms. Wett and Dr. Howard, as more businesses are reopening, and I've heard from employers in Kentucky on how critical to ensure the workplace safety guidance is consistent across the federal government and that agencies are not providing conflicting information. Can you both elaborate on how you work together and coordinate the public health agencies during the pandemic? Well, I'll take it first. Uh, we work very closely with OSHA to make sure that does not happen. That's the worst outcome that we as one government can make is to have conflicting information. So any information that involves the workplace, we run by OSHA for their comments. I would say we have an excellent working relationship with our federal partners, especially at NIOSH and CDC. I know our folks are on the phone with Dr. Howard's folks all the time, but I do believe that in, in the response to this pandemic, you've seen an all of government um, pro process here. And so anything that we put out has also been vetted um, to make sure that we're not in opposition with any of our other federal partners. Thank you, and I appreciate the hard work you guys are doing. And I know we're all concerned, both sides, that, that people show up in a place where they can be safe and to work. And I know you're trying to put that out in an ever-changing environment. I know businesses are trying to figure out how to do it in an ever-changing environment. And uh, we all need to work together and, and pull together to make this work. And thank you for your efforts. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, uh, yield back. Thank you, Mr. Guffrey. Uh, let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Courtney. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman, for holding this hearing today. Um, this Saturday in New London, Connecticut, there's going to be a memorial service for Elva Graveline, who is a, a certified nurse's aide who worked at a local hospital there, 52 years old, uh, mother of two, grandmother of three, who succumbed to COVID uh, a couple weeks ago. And um, again, there, there, there were stories in the human face of people who really are the good guys. Uh, she was a caregiver who treated her job as a CNA as a calling, not as a job, 23 years, described as kind-hearted. And um, again, it just reinforces that this is not a theoretical academic issue. This is really about human beings who um, are doing right by all of us in terms of keeping this country going forward. Um, I just want to just touch base with both witnesses about the fact that this is not the first pandemic that OSHA has encountered. The AIDS HIV um, pandemic in the late mid 80s, late 80s, and early 90s, OSHA acted, and it acted very swiftly to put into place real standards in terms of uh, bloodborne pathogens. Uh, my wife is a nurse practitioner. She worked at Bellevue back in the 80s there, and she still remembers the day where, again, you drew blood and used uh, needles with no gloves, uh, and, and there was no such thing as disposable needles. OSHA created with a standard, an enforceable standard, the, the regime that we now just sort of take for granted when we go into hospitals, was OSHA wrong to, to institute a standard versus just uh, operating with guidelines? I believe OSHA followed the direction of this committee through a statutory requirement to establish that standard. Correct, I mean, it was with prodding from Congress uh, that they actually moved. And again, it wasn't a five to 20 year process. I mean, it, ha it happened in, in much uh, swifter terms. And again, Dr. Howard, did OSHA do the right thing by, impose, by implementing a standard to deal with AIDS, HIV? I think so, and I'd like to point out that they followed California's lead in that area. So again, what, when we talk about having a standard put into place, uh, this is not some wild, unprecedented sort of um, notion. I mean, the fact of the matter is, is it's just part of the, the reality every day when people walk into doctor's offices uh, or hospitals. Again, Dr. Howard, your description of how to safely uh, disinfect 
uh, N95 masks uh, that you testified to earlier was, uh, again, I think a learning experience for all of us about the fact that you've got to really actually do more than just throw it in the washing machine, that you know, there's, there's real um, issues that you've got to do it the right way. Why wouldn't you know, that sort of um, you know, standard be, be really something that would help guide uh, a lot of employers. And I'll tell you, because you know, this is relevant in Connecticut, which again, has been very hard hit. Again, we've had tremendous you know, um, donations from you know, private individuals as well as FEMA in terms of getting uh, masks, N95 masks. But some of them, as you point out, are different. They're not all the same. So if you're a hospital or a nursing home trying to you know, organize this, I mean, you need, it sounds to me, based on your testimony, you know, more than just lumping them all together and, and disinfecting them in exactly the same fashion. So, so why wouldn't that be a good thing to have you know, that more precise advice that you described out there so that employers really would, would know that you, you've got to do more than just treat them all the same? Well, I certainly think that the more specification that you could provide an employer, the more helpful it is to that singular in workplace. Uh, the, the problem is uh, we can't do guidance that's highly specific to each establishment, so we have to do fairly general guidance and then look at the application, help employers, uh, both NIOSH, CDC, and OSHA, through their consultation service, apply those guidelines to their specific workplace. But, but again, having a standard which just says you've got to do, you've got to look at the manufacturer's specifications when you are going to, you know, reuse, um, you know, N95 masks. Um, that's just like you pointed out, necessary to make sure that these these workers, when they reuse them, are actually going to be protected. And again, I, I would just say, you know, one of my wife's good friends back home is a um, a nurse at a local hospital who's been intubating COVID patients with reused N95 masks. I mean, they, they were basically reusing them over a period of seven days. You could not get in a more high-risk situation than intubating a patient um, as, as a worker. And, um, you know, that just shows how life and death, you know, having, you know, real standards out there so that people like Don are going to be safe in terms of doing, you know, just amazing work in terms of saving lives. I yield back. Thank you. Is the gentleman from Michigan prepared to uh, ask questions? Ask questions. Yes. The gentleman from Michigan is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the other gentleman. Uh, yes. Wait a minute. Wait, excuse me, uh, Andy. The other gentleman from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> Hi, Tim. I yield to my esteemed colleague from Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Sorry. I'm sorry. Thank a you. Andy, it's good to see you. Hope you're well. And uh, just wonder what that guy was spraying or looking at in, in, in your, uh, your basement or whatever. So it's, it's been interesting to watch. And uh, I'll tell you later. <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. And uh, I, I would concur that, that we ought to do this regularly, have live hearings where we're here in the room. Uh, it's the best way to get the work done. And I think by now we should be capable of handling this, plus we have a lot to consider. Um, Lauren, it's good to see you back. Thank you, it sir. seems strange that you're not sitting behind me and telling me what to say and what to do when I chaired this subcommittee I agree. for six years. So <laughs> you, you got me through well on that, and I'm sure that you're giving it your best, best effort now where you're at, and we appreciate that. Uh, having been away for votes, I, I Probably missed some questions might have asked, but there were a few that I really wanted to ask you as well. And it goes back to guidance. Um, and as we wrestled with that whole idea, I know during, during the time we worked together on what rules needed to be in place and uh, what, um, what laws had to be in place and how you could work in a system that mandated to be, be loose on your feet, as it were, to deal with situations that came up um, whether it was in a mining situation, a manufacturing situation, or now, of course, the hospital situations that are going on. 
Um, let, me, let me ask again why the agency believes it's better to issue guidance as opposed to a new regulation response to COVID-19 spread. And if you could also uh, provide a, a real-world example um, of, of, uh, of where your agency would have de been delayed in its response if you'd had a hard and fast rule or law in place as opposed to guidance. Well, thank you, Mr. Wahlberg, um, and I appreciate the kind words and I share the sentiment. Um, but I, I think what we have seen over the last three months is, um, as I, I said, we're at um, 5,000 complaints related to COVID and um, the, the, the agency's taken almost the same number of complaints that are in our unfortunately normal safety and health um, concerns. So what, with the way this virus has changed and our understanding of it, our guidance documents have been able to address um, what we know today. Uh, we issued construction guidance just on Monday. Uh, we have more coming out maybe even as I speak. And um, you know, we've gone from uh, the idea of not wearing masks to now everyone, almost everyone in this room wearing masks. And that's a two month evolution of thought process. So uh, we're able to look at um, what is happening and respond and put that information out as expeditiously as possible through our website. And uh, yet our, our folks are still, as I've said, 24 seven out there responding to COVID and unfortunately responding to other safety and health concerns um, as, as um, people are returning to work we're seeing a small increase in um, problems related um, to what I would call um, what we do on an everyday basis related to safety and health. So this is a good opportunity, I think, to remind folks that um, all of their obligations exist under the OSH Act and that employers need to really be focused on those as um, they restart their businesses. Um, in a... In a uh Committee Democrat uh, forum held on May 14th. Former Assistant Secretary for OSHA, uh, David Michaels, who I worked with extensively back then, told members that if he was in charge of the agency during the COVID-19 pandemic, it would be doing inspections of high profile workplaces and would be talking to the media uh, to inform workers of their rights. Yet by all accounts, OSHA is doing just uh, that, uh, can you uh, elaborate on the department's efforts in this regard, and are there any other misleading statements made by our friends on the other side of the aisle that their union allies and their union allies that, that you would like to clear up? Um, I would like to highlight um, one part of your question about whistleblowers. I think um, you could not get a better spokesperson for whistleblower protection than the Secretary of Labor at the White House. And he pointedly said on April 9th that um, retaliation would not be tolerated. Our whistleblower investigators have tackled the almost 2,000 COVID and, and complaints that we've received and the other 2,000 complaints that we've received from our other um, 23 or 22 statutes. So um, we have seen success with reinstatement of whistleblowers. Um, we've seen, uh, as I said, letters of reprimand removed, and we've seen actual policy changes by businesses to ensure that uh, workers have the right to express concerns about their safety and health in the workplace. Um, I'm not really sure where people aren't seeing that message, but truly the Secretary of Labor, there's no higher authority in my world um, from the White House to determine and determinedly say that this is not acceptable behavior. Appreciate that. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, gentleman, gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. Bonamici. Uh, thank you to the chair and the ranking member uh, and also to our witnesses today. Um, we, we just yesterday in the United States passed 100,000 deaths and those aren't just numbers, they're real people. Um, and and our, our thoughts and prayers are with their families, but we have to keep in mind uh, that the Occupational Safety and Health Administration and the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health have an obligation to prevent workers from hazardous conditions on the job. And they're falling short. Too many workers are facing risks 
at work. In the absence of leadership uh, from the agencies, I was proud to join Chairman Stott in introducing the COVID-19 Every Worker Protection Act, and I was pleased that it was included in the HEROES Act, and my thoughts are with those essential workers who are showing up every day despite the risks the nurses, the doctors, the grocery store workers, the firefighters, postal employers, child care workers, health workers, uh, they're the heart and soul of our communities right now, and they're going to help us get through this. Dr. Howard, I want to ask you, the CDC and, um, recently changed its guidance allowing healthcare workers to use surgical masks rather than N95 respirators. After the CDC issued this guidance, then many hospitals denied healthcare workers access to N95s. News reports document cases of healthcare workers who objected to the CDC guidance and had their credentials challenged and were fired for insubordination and some who tragically died of COVID-19 uh, because they lacked access to proper PPE, personal protective equipment. So Dr. Howard, was the change in the CDC guidelines based on shortages in personal protective equipment or based on new scientific information? Thank you for that question. Uh, the answer is unequivocally, it was based on a crisis strategy that we have a global shortage of the supply of N95 respirators. The science has not changed. It's only our current situation of supply. Thank you. Um, Ms. Sweat, you noticed, noted in your testimony that OSHA has the tools to protect workers from COVID-19 by enforcing the general duty clause and other existing OSHA standards. OSHA has received, as you noted, nearly 5,000 complaints and referrals related to COVID-19. And those range, it's my understanding, from outbreaks in the workplace to lack of access to PPE and insufficient physical distancing practices. The majority of these cases have been closed without action. So Ms. Sweat, how many COVID-19 related citations has OSHA issued under the general duty clause? Sorry, at this point we've issued one citation under an existing standard and um, I would note that we still have six months to complete any investigation um, or enforcement action. So uh, I, I think relying on uh, looking at citations is maybe not the best parameters here. What we are really trying to do is remove the worker from the hazard or remove the hazard from the workplace. And so our priority has been that. We have been proactively working on all of those issues when we receive these complaints. Employers get information in case they are not fully aware and they're able to change their work practice where we do not find a worker or an employer who is protecting their workers, we will enforce. Ms. Sweat, I, I'm gonna I keep my time because I have some more questions. How many COVID-19 related citations has OSHA issued under any existing standard? Uh, as I said, we've had one within the last week and um, you know, there's still a very a substantial amount of time within our statute of limitations. These I understand, cases, but just, just one. And, and it's my understanding that was for a record keeping violation. I, and, and I understand that general duty clause citation uh, could take more time, which is why it would be more efficient and effective for OSHA to issue an emergency temporary standard. But in your testimony, you emphasized that OSHA's existing standards for respirators, PPE, and sanitation. Can these, can these uh, citations be issued faster? We have to build a legal case to defend our citations. And I do not believe that rushing to um, issue a citation is really the best effort. Um, what our folks need to do and are doing is proactively inspect and investigate all complaints that we receive and um, build the appropriate legal case to defend those. To issue a citation that is not legally defensible would be irresponsible on our part. And, and I appreciate that, but in my home state of Oregon, Oregon OSHA has been more proactive. Their efforts have, have not been perfect, but I've been calling on them to do more to protect workers. Uh, Oregon OSHA recently issued a willful violation to a business in only nine days. So what prevents the federal OSHA issuing citations in a similar time? Uh, nothing prevents that, but what I don't think you see related to our complaints is when we provide the employer information to protect their workers and their practices change. 
And that is um, one of the key elements is to remove the, um, the worker from the hazard or remove the hazard. So we think that there's positive action occurring when we have um, taken these complaints. And when we see an employer who is not um, moving to make appropriate changes, we can enforce. Well, I, I also want to note, um, Mr. Chairman and, and colleagues, this committee received a letter from Dr. Rayfield dated May 20th. And with that letter, Dr. Excuse me, Redfield uh, attached the table with the CDC available data on healthcare worker infection rates. He also noted um, that it is likely an underestimate and not all cases are reported to the CDC. And I just want to note how challenging it is, not only for you at, at OSHA and NIOSH to do your work, but for us as policymakers to make good policy decisions without good data. So, uh, and, I, and I know I'm, my time is about to expire or has expired, but I just want to know that we really need good we really need good data and we don't have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Grothman. Yes, a, a couple questions. Um, first of all, I think things are getting better, but part of the problem you're gonna hear from employers is a lack of PPE, okay? And in my district, we have some uh, ability uh, to make more masks, for example, which I think is one of the big things that employers are going to need. Um, but I'm wondering, are either of your agencies doing anything? It frustrates me because I think we should have been weighing in harder and the, the, the industry of my district is just doing yeoman's work in, in getting their new machines up and running quicker than they would in normal circumstances. But I'm a little bit frustrated, uh, say with regard to FEMA, well, I think maybe could have waited a little bit more or done a little bit more. Are you guys doing anything in your agencies to make sure the PPE is available for the businesses or keeping track of how much we need or working in coordination with FEMA or something like that? I'll start very quickly because I think Dr. Howard has um, a more robust um, responsibility in this area. Uh, one thing that OSHA has participated in over the last three months mm -hmm. is um, the Supply Chain Task Force. And um, so our folks have been working um, with our federal partners uh, to um, determine how we can get more supply in. And um, again, I, I testified um, previously, the most important thing that we did was our five guidance documents to try and assure that um, there was PPE respiratory um, protection available. Um, related to the burn rate within hospitals, and I'll refer to Dr. Howard. Thank you very much. Uh, we work uh, at NIOSH with, uh, with our partners at CDC. CDC is part of the National Response Coordination Center, which is run by FEMA. Um, currently, the um, SNS, the national stockpile, is purchasing 800 uh, million respirators. Uh, on the supply side, um, 3M is now up to 90 million respirators per month. Honeywell's up to 20 million respirators per month. So we're seeing a change now from where we were three months ago. So the supply is increasing. Now I can't say the distribution of that supply in every corner of the United States is the same, but the supply, the supply pipeline is increasing. Okay, how many? mass a month do you think we need? You know, that's a very difficult thing to figure out. You One of be, the things that target. the NRCC is doing is looking at, as uh, Lauren said, that supply chain. What is the utilization? And we have a PPE burn rate calculator, which is now an app that in, uh, individual hospitals can use to figure out their own burn rate of that PPE, and we have a PPE monitoring system where we have about 100 hospitals enrolled to date where we're developing that national system so we can figure out what's the inventory and what's the utilization rate. Presumably you want some in places other than hospitals too. Aren't there other employers who you're going to want it for as well? Sure. What we're talking about, though, right now is the N95 respirator, which is, as we've talked about, used for aerosolized procedures in hospitals. And what's, what's your target? How many a day do you think you need? Do you, have a, you must have an idea. Well, we're talking in the billions uh, in that, order to bring us two back. Two million, five million, what, what is your target? For the national supply? Correct. Yeah, that number I don't know, but it's certainly in the billions. Okay. 
Uh, Ms. Sweet, thanks for being here today again. Uh, I'd like to ask you how OSHA helps employers determine worker risk of occupational exposure to COVID-19. I have a lot of manufacturing uh, facilities in my district. Um, based on their specific operations, manufacturers may feel they fall into high risk, medium risk, low risk. Um, what's the biggest determining factor in the decision as to how close manufacturing workers are? Uh, what's the biggest factor in determining how close manufacturing workers can be to each other throughout the day? And what are, what are other factors uh, that go into the classification of high risk, medium risk, or low risk? Sure, it's the sustained contact issue. Um, so I think we have put out manufacturing guidance um, to help uh, folks uh, work through the issues. Um, it, it's really uh, incumbent upon the employer to do an analysis of their work practices and determine if there are changes that they can make. And, um, you know, we have our hierarchy of controls within there. Um, I know some folks uh, find that to be um, maybe tedious, but I think that um, manufacturers have folks that are, um, you know, trained in this area. But um, it, it's really a, an important um, part of the agency as well that we have client compliance assistance specialists I, I, I and they're available. I need a question, which just kind of popped into my head. Sure. There is a feeling among some medical professionals that eventually, regardless of what we do, this COVID is going to go through the population. We should maybe protect the vulnerable, but it is inevitable that it will go through the population as a whole. The only question is how long that's going to take. Do you believe that or not? Five years from now, assuming we don't get a vaccine, is everybody going to be touched by it or not? What do you think? Um, I think that's outside of my jurisdiction at OSHA, and I would refer to Dr. Howard. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. We're, we're out of time. Uh, do you want me to respond? Briefly. Uh, yeah, th there's no timeline. Uh, as, as, as Dr. Fauci has said at NIH, we're talking about 12 to 18 months, perhaps, at the outside for a vaccine. We hope for it being sooner. That would certainly be great. The issue about everybody in the population getting COVID-19, the issue is, do they all show up in the same emergency room at the same time? That's the issue, is protecting the healthcare system. So you believe it's inevitable over five years? Ago. I don't believe it's inevitable, but I do think that if everybody gets it all at once, you're gonna end up crashing your healthcare system. Thank you very much, yeah, thank you very much. Let me recognize our distinguished chair of um, education and labor committee, the gentleman from Virginia. Mr. Scott, you are recognized. Thank you, and thank our witnesses for being with us today. Um, Ms. Wood, you've indicated that you're not responding to uh, questions involving the emergency temporary standard. I agree with the gentleman from Alabama that uh, no good lawyer likes his client talking about uh, issues under litigation. But as the um, uh, chair has indicated, you need a legal basis for that claim. Are you claiming a legal privilege? And if so, which specific privilege are you claiming? I've been advised by department counsel not to answer questions on ETS. Did you, um, can you provide for the record, apparently you don't know which privilege they're using. If you could provide for the committee exactly which legal privilege you're relying on in order not to ask, answer questions. Um, and you've indicated in your testimony that um, OSHA considers retaliation against the workers unacceptable. How many complaints of retaliation has OSHA received, and how many businesses have been sanctioned for retaliation? Um, we have, uh, as of May 26, 1,374 uh, whistleblower complaints for COVID, and um, there's no statute of limitations on the investigations of those. So while investigations are ongoing, I can tell you in certain circumstances we have seen um, resolution almost immediately when the whistleblower calls to initiate the investigation. Well, by resolution, do you mean the, the worker got, the, got, their job, got their job back? Yes, sir. Well, that's not a sanction. They shouldn't have been fired to begin with. How many businesses have been sanctioned? Uh, at this juncture, I don't believe we have issued any sanctions per se. We there's, have seen so, um, so back pay, re, uh, reinstatement and back pay. And I think one of the more important um, issues is um, the change of approach by some of these businesses about how they address safety and health. So people have been fired for, um, um, in retaliation for making a complaint 
and the business has really shown no deter there's no deterrence for, for that for that action. They reinstate and they have to pay back pay. At okay. At which they, they owed the pay to begin with, and the person shouldn't have been fired to begin with, but there's no, no sanction. We know that there are many deaths in nursing homes, meat packing plants, as well as health care facilities. Uh, the general duty clause is generally used, generally used after a death or serious injury, not for prevention. How many site visits have been conducted by OSHA proactively for prevention rather than in response to a death or some kind of complaint? I would say everything that we do is proactive, and um, we have issued nursing home guidance. And I would also point back to everything that we've done to try and protect the respirator supply for individuals well, in this area. I ask area. you, how many, how many have been proactive and not in response to a death or a complaint in your um, um, response to questions and writing that, that you, re you responded? You said all of OSHA's inspections are initiated through unprogrammed activity. Those were either opened as a fatal fatality inspection, a catastrophe inspection, uh, response to employer reports of hospitalized, hospitalized workers, or initiated in response to complaints. None were proactive prevention. I would say that if you look at what we have done in previous natural disasters or other emergency situations where we have suspended enforcement, we proactively chose to not suspend enforcement in this area. And so, in fact, we have proactively pursued complaint inspections and investigations and done on-sites where proactively we Proactively in response to complaints. Well, that's not proactive. Um, is, the, is OSHA bound by the policy of eliminating two rules in order to establish a new rule? The Department of whole, as a whole is, yes. So you can't establish an emergency temporary standard without repealing two, two other rules? I think that's a question that you're trying to get on the emergency temporary standard area. Um, the two for one is uh, larger than just the agency. Okay, well. and so. I have a question for Dr. Doc, doc, Dr. Howard. You formerly worked in California. Uh, does California have an airborne transmissible disease standard, and what should Congress consider in drafting legislation to protect workers from airborne infectious diseases? Well, certainly California does have an aerosol transmissible disease standard, uh, but I'll leave the legislating to people who do that for a living. Uh, how long has it been in effect? So I think it was 2013, somewhere around there. Uh, it was in development for a number of years before that. Um. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. Uh, the gentleman from Kentucky, Mr. Comer, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Sweat, we've heard untrue claims that the Trump administration did not act soon enough uh, to prevent coronas from entering our country. Can you give some detail about the actions taken by your agency prior to COVID-19 being declared a pandemic by the World Health Organization on March 11th to ensure that healthcare workers and other essential businesses were prepared to respond to unprecedented workplace safety challenges? Thank you, Congressman, for the question. OSHA has start, had started as early as January of this year um, putting information on our website through a safety and health topics page to inform um, individuals about the pandemic, which at that point was um, an unknown novel coronavirus. Um, we've pursued uh, updating our safety and health topics page. We outlined what standards we thought uh, employers should be aware of that they should be in compliance with. And we've subsequently provided general industry guidance along with almost 20 um, actual uh, individual industry guidance documents to help employers respond to this pandemic. Dr. Howard, the poultry and beef cattle industries are uh, major industries in my congressional district, and I have four major poultry processing facilities located in my district. Uh, two of those have been uh, significantly affected by minor COVID-19 outbreaks. You, you testified that NISH has been on the ground in dozens of meat packing and meat processing facilities across the country, conducting site visits and providing recommendations to employers based on your observations. Can you explain some of the work 
place safety challenges you have observed in these facilities and how businesses are implementing measures to address these challenges? Sure. Uh, as I said, um, you know, this, uh, whether it's beef or pork or chicken, uh, these are very labor intensive activities. And people are extremely close together on a production line. And if the fundamental principle for uh, protecting uh, workers from COVID-19 is to separate people, it is really a feasibility challenge in uh, these meat processing plants. So we've come up with a number of different recommendations. In fact, they fill about 15 pages of our joint uh, CDC OSHA guidance to try to help employers figure out how they can do that and still be able to produce the food the country needs. A and that is a real challenge. Uh, I think we've, we've learned uh, as, a, as a public, I'm, I'm an agriculture guy, former commissioner of agriculture, so I, was, I knew this already, but a lot of Americans are, are figuring out that um, employees at food processing facilities are very essential workers. So I appreciate uh, what you're doing there. Yeah, there have been a few local hotspots in my congressional district, a very few, I have 35 counties, I've probably had four counties that have had any you know, measurable uh, activity in, as far as being a, a hotspot in, in my congressional district, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, and in Kentucky, businesses are slowly, and I can't say this enough, in Kentucky, very slowly reopening. Uh, every employer wants safety that, that I know of. The CDC now recommends that everyone should wear a mask in public settings. Uh, this would apply to businesses and their employees as they return to the workplaces. Dr. Howard, are there any circumstances in which an employer should not have their employees wear a mask? Well, there are. There are some folks that have uh, pre-existing respiratory conditions, mm -hmm. uh, things that are over their mouth make it difficult for them to breathe. They already have a difficult time breathing, so putting a mask on their nose and mouth can make it more difficult. So certainly those folks may not be able to wear a respirator, and they may complain to the employer. They just can't tolerate it. So some, some workers are going to be in that category. What about the recommendation that some states are implementing, I think based on CDC recommendations with respect to youth sports, that young people wear masks, like for example, playing baseball this summer. My son's on a tribal baseball team and you know the temperature gets up in the 100 degree weather and they're outside, they're spread out pretty good, but uh, our governor came out and said that those kids need to wear a mask. Is that something that should be of a concern? For, for uh, children, you know, 11, 12 years old or younger, wearing masks outside in 100 degree weather? You know, uh, CDC is just getting into the area of sports, uh, both professional, amateur, and, uh, and children's sports. So we don't have uh, a lot of guidance on that area, but these are the kind of issues that we're all going to face as we approach the summer in terms of reopening. Thank you, uh, sir. So these we're are the things time. that we're thinking about. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to recognize the uh, gentleman from Michigan. Um, Mr. Levin, you are recognized, sir. Thank you so much, Madam Chairwoman, and thanks for holding this very important hearing. Uh, earlier, I think perhaps in a discussion with Mr. Courtney, uh, Dr. Howard, you said that uh, during the AIDS crisis, Congress required and uh, OSHA implemented a mandatory standard uh, to protect workers during the AIDS crisis. Is that correct? Uh, yes, I think it was actually Ms. Sweat that referred to the congressional mandate uh, at that time. Okay, but so that happened then. And then uh, some of my colleagues mentioned that uh, quite extensively that uh, the Trump administration has acted similarly to the Obama administration during the SARS outbreak, um, and so that this is an appropriate response. Um, Ms. Sweat, are you aware of how many Americans died during the SARS outbreak? I don't have those figures in front of me now. Well, let me share them with you from the CDC website. In the United States of America, eight persons 
were laboratory confirmed as SARS cases, and there were no SARS-related deaths in the United States. Would you consider that to be a comparable situation to what we're going through now? I can tell you from the place that I That's sit at the no Occupational question, Safety and Health Administration. Excuse me? Ma'am, ma'am, I'm sorry I'm, I'm not in the room with you, but that's a yes or no question. Um, I Is have to tell you from where I sit at the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, we're at almost 5,000 complaints on COVID, and um, we are responding as rapidly as we okay, can. Okay, I've got to move on. I've got to move on with my questions. Uh, so the NPR just reported uh, this morning that we've had close to 300 United States health care workers alone killed by COVID-19. And uh, obviously we've had 100,000 Americans who've passed away from COVID-19. Uh, oops. Uh, Ms. Sweat, more than three quarters of OSHA COVID-19 related inspections have been fatality investigations. To put it bluntly, OSHA is stepping in only once someone has died. Every day I get calls from workers who are terrified that they will become sick in their workplaces. Many worry not for their own lives, but for the lives of sick or elderly family members that they reside with and support. What should I tell those frightened workers and those vulnerable workers about the fact that OSHA refuses to issue any mandatory standards in the greatest workplace health care crisis in our history? As I've said before, OSHA has existing standards to address a variety of aspects of this virus, and we are enforcing where we find failure to comply. Ma'am, you've issued one citation in the greatest crisis. You say you're acting proactively, but in fact, what you're doing is the definition of reactive. You are refusing to act proactively and issue a mandatory standard of any kind during the greatest health care crisis in the workplace in modern history. If your agency inspects workplaces only after a worker has died, you are not preventing worker infections. I would suggest that your agency could be acting strategically, looking proactively at industry sectors, deterring the worst actors, identifying infection vectors, and protecting workers from being put in situation uh, situations of unnecessary and cruel risk, but your agency is waiting for the worst possible outcomes before taking action. This is simply unconscionable. Let me uh, ask a question of Dr. Howard. Sir, how long have you been in this field of uh, uh, occupational medicine uh, yourself? Uh, since 1981. And sir, have you ever seen a comparable situation of the scope and scale of health risk in American workplaces during your, your long and distinguished career? The only comparison I can make is in the 1980s with the human immunodeficiency virus. Thank you very much. You have time. Thank you. Uh, I want to recognize now the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Spok Smucker. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, Ms. Sweat, uh, thank you so much for rebalancing OSHA's mission to ensure compliance assistance is a priority. As a former construction business owner, I know how important uh, that can be. Uh, employers really do want to do the right thing. They care about their employees. They want to keep employees safe. And feeling like they can ask OSHA for assistance to ensure they are doing things correctly is absolutely critical. It, it appears to me my colleagues on the other side of the aisle are looking to pin OSHA as the scapegoat and place blame for the spread of a global pandemic on employers. And I'll just 
food for thought. That may seem like a pro-worker stance right now, but it won't be very pro-worker when their misguided targeting causes them to lose all their jobs due to business closures. So a question for you. Um, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle seem to think the guidance you put out is optional and that employers can choose to follow them. Uh, they'll argue that this is why we need to pass more onerous laws that will end up in a legal spider web that do not meet the needs of all industries. Do you think that rhetoric could ultimately be more dangerous for workers if employers are misled to believe that they don't ne legally need to follow your guidance? Well, I definitely think it's problematic, but I think what we need to say here is employers do need to know and understand their obligations under the Occupational Safety and Health Act. They need to make a plan. They need to determine what they need to do to um, protect their workers. And the time to do that is now before a dramatic reopening. I know we've talked a lot today about essential workers. And um, you know we've looked at as a lot of these essential worker um, categories and have tried to provide um, the best updated, scientifically accurate guidance that we can. And um, you know we will continue to do our work. And if I could respond briefly to the previous question that I received, um, you know OSHA has responded to almost uh, 5,000 COVID complaints. And what we are trying to achieve every day is removing the worker from the hazard or removing the hazard from the workplace. So, so can you tell me a little bit more about that uh, process, the screening process when you do get a complaint? How, how does it get evaluated? How long does it take? How is it determined that OSHA will open an investigation? And, and if so, what does the investigation entail? Thank you. Um, the investigation entails the employer being put immediately on alert that um, we understand there could be a problem in their workplace. They have to respond to us. They have to tell us what they're doing um, to resolve the complaint. If we find the resolution that they've proffered uh, inappropriate or um, not protective of the worker, we can convert to an inspection and um, you know, work to our enforcement. But again, it's removing the worker from the hazard or removing the hazard from the workplace. These are really the goals that we need to be focused on to protect workers and not just issuing citations. Thank you. I'm going to go to Dr. Howard. I'd like to thank you for the work that uh, your agency is doing to produce the guidance that all Americans are relying on to make safe decisions as they navigate uh, the threat of COVID-19. We appreciate all the long hours that both uh, you and your team at NIOSH, as well as the team folks at OSHA are putting in to ensure that guidance is there. It really is needed for employers uh, to safely reopen. I know NIOSH has played a central role in finding ways uh, to overcome the global shortage of PPE. Uh, and we've heard that from hospitals in our district uh, that it's been difficult to find sources. Just what information can you share uh, to help them address PPE shortages and also in, uh, employers as well? How do they find appropriate and safe PPE? Well, uh, as I mentioned before, the supply of filtering face piece respirators like N95s is increasing. I pointed out that domestic manufacturers like 3M and Honeywell have uh, doubled, tripled their production capabilities. Uh, 3M it's, uh, is making 90 million N95s per month. Honeywell's making 20 million N95s per month. So I want to get in one additional question. I know that CDC collects data on instances in which COVID exposure could have happened in the workplace. How can we truly determine if someone's exposure did indeed occur in the workplace? Well, thank you for that question. That is a very difficult question to answer, to tease out what is true occupational exposure from what is community exposure that is then carried into the workplace. Remember, this virus doesn't have wings or feet. It has to have a person carry it around. So distinguishing between occupational transmission and community transmission is uh, a topic that is uh, involving some very smart epidemiologists at CDC currently. Thank you very much. Uh, you're out of time. Let me recognize now the gentlelady from Florida, Dr. Shalala. You're recognized. 
Uh, thank you very much. Ms. Sweet, uh, you told Re Representative Bath to look at the regulatory agenda for the status of the OSHA infectious disease standard. That standard is languishing on the long-term um, agenda without action. After 100,000 deaths and thousands of worker deaths, how can you not be working on that particular standard? Thank you for the question, Dr. Shalala. Um, because at this juncture, we are working on responding to the COVID pandemic. And um, putting the regulatory agenda aside, the work of this agency has been focused on protecting workers and, um, again, removing them from the hazard. And, and that's, uh, you know, our, our primary mission and goal right now is to execute that work. Uh uh, I didn't understand that answer, but let me go on to Dr. Howard, because I'm interested in data. Um, the uh, CMS has issued regulations that require that all long-term care facilities and nursing homes that receive Medicare and Medicaid funding uh, uh, report um, the number of infections and deaths among residents and staff members, PPP supplies, staffing shortages, and testing and ventilator CMS has said that these facility reports will be publicly available. Um, wouldn't it make sense to add the requirement for hospitals to report healthcare worker COVID-19 infections and deaths to the existing reporting requirements? I looked at the CDC uh, new requirements for the states. CMS is going to collect better data, and I would think that after they set out the nursing home and long-term care facilities data that they wanted, that they ought to extend it to hospitals and other healthcare institutions. Uh, could you react to that? Sure, and uh, I think that's up to CMS. But on the CDC front, uh, we are moving in data modernization to uh, taking the beginning of the pipeline for disease surveillance data, which is the healthcare uh, facility, uh, and then the state health department, and then to CDC. We're looking at electronic data modernization, and we thank the, uh, the Congress for the additional funds that are available there. In the here and now, we have redone our case report form, which includes specific sections about healthcare workers as well as workplace exposures. So we're hoping that that new form, which the states now are getting uh, up to speed on, will improve our ability to know exactly where the occupational uh, industry and occupations are in the American workforce. Um, let me follow up on that. As you know, the CDC has had trouble getting states to use uniform um, standards for information so that you couldn't compare it uh, nationally. Will this particular standard be the same for every state or will they be able to vary it as they have in the past? Thank you for that question, uh, excellent question. We are trying to move to a uniform national surveillance disease reporting system. So that is the goal. Uh, with the cooperation of the states, we hope that, and uh, the states have challenges, uh, some states have some IT uh, support challenges in getting there, but hopefully we're going to be much better off than we have been in terms of national disease surveillance. It includes nursing homes, I assume. Uh, yes, it includes any kind of uh, institution that is uh, reporting a disease uh, that, uh, as, as you well know, having been Secretary of HHS, the CSTE and uh, CDC have agreed to collaborate on reporting that particular uh, condition to the federal government. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to yield now to the gentleman from Kansas. Mr. Watkins, you recognize. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, oh, oh just a minute. I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Muser, you are recognized. I apologize, Mr. Watkins. No apology necessary. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you both for being here uh, very much, um, being present and answering our questions. So uh, getting our economy open, Getting people back to work is just about a top priority, right above all else, um, as, as well as getting our schools open come, uh, come September. So I, maybe I could ask a couple of questions about that as well. But the, um, uh, what, what's 
crucial, of course, is that businesses open with a high level of health and safety, workplace standards. And I, I am a firm believer that our businesses need to open, but we need to in a very responsible manner. Uh, and I don't think that this is going to be over the short term. Businesses need to prepare for a longer term, uh, evolving, always improving uh, health and uh, safety work environment. So from OSHA's standpoint, I, I know, uh, uh, Ms. Sweat, you've been putting out, OSHA's been putting out guidance for a while now, I think as many as 26 or 27 different forms of workplace guidance. I assume that th that's going to continue to evolve. And, and I haven't read them all, my apologies, but are you offering the, the essentials behind social distancing, uh, and again, as guidance, um, uh, PPEs, the masks, when it's appropriate to wear to wear gloves, are is is OSHA's guidance um, getting that specific? Um, our guidance is pretty comprehensive, yes. And I think um, as folks look to returning to work, employers should start to plan now um, about how they're going to protect their workers. They can do that by examining work practices, and um, our guidance speaks to a variety of different work practices. Um, so, yes, uh, our, for example, our meatpacking guidance discusses um, social distancing as well as carpooling. Um, so I think that it's robust guidance to um, provide information to employers and workers. Okay. Are businesses, are you finding, asking for any additional funding or some sort of support uh, to set themselves up with plexiglass and, and everything else? Who knows, maybe even building another annex so as all, all uh, workplace areas can be six feet uh, apart. Are you getting requests such as that? I'm not getting funding requests, but um, our compliance assistance specialists and um, our compliance assistance program has received almost 5,000 um, requests for information. So I think people are looking to the agency for answers. Okay. And Mr. Ha uh, Dr. Howard, are you involved as well in putting out guidance for, for, for workplace? I read some of your your background. Yes, that's an understatement. We have reams of guidance available in very specific situations. Okay. Uh, is, is CDC, is OSHA adopting it? Is it? Are you finding it to be practical and useful? A lot of the guidance that relates to workplaces specifically and workers are reviewed by uh, OSHA folks before they're issued by CDC, so there's a collaborative effort. Okay. Is OSHA finding high level of compliance. I spend a tremendous amount of time talking with businesses throughout my district and visiting them under, even under today's circumstances, because they're, they're, they're working. Um, and so, so we go out, are you finding a high level of compliance, uh, Ms. Sweat? I think there's a mixture of results, but I do think that um, employers are attempting to achieve um, the best protection that they can. And again, where we fail to see that, um, our enforcement folks will, will be right there. Okay. I would, um, do you offer any models? Do you use any companies as examples? There are many throughout my district, if you're interested in, in, in those, that, that not only have made their workplace very comfortable and very safe, but the records show it. Many of them have, have had no COVID cases with over 500 employees, and they've been, they've been following strict guidelines. That they that they get the feedback from their their workers, which is smart for um, uh, for how to achieve this. Uh, are you gaining such information on a regular basis and offering models? Um, we're very fortunate that people are providing um, some of their return to work practices, and so we can um, review that in context of our standards. And um, you know, we're actively in, uh, participating in webinars. Uh, with a variety of um, stakeholders and uh, the union folks have been talking to us. So um, we're engaged, we're open, we're listening, and we'll adapt um, our guidance documents to what we're learning. Well, it's, 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 it's very important, obviously not a higher priority than finding a vaccine and, and, and uh, correcting the, the, the virus itself. Lastly, are you providing any information for uh, restaurants uh, and for the actual opening, are you, are, you, are you planning ahead for what restaurants can do in order to There's open safely? CDC guidance available already. Yeah. Uh, CDC has guidance on restaurants and bars. Right, but it needs to evolve. That guidance doesn't necessarily include people sitting down and 
operating. Yes, the current guidance uh, has all of those issues. Uh, but you. I also mentioned that all of our guidance is evolving, and so additional information may be available. Thank you. Thanks. We look forward Jones to that. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me uh, yield now to the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Castro. You are recognized. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman, and thank you all for your testimony today. On April 28th, President Trump announced that he would issue an executive order that would use the Defense Production Act to force meatpacking plants to remain open, leaving tens of thousands of workers in unsafe conditions. The actual executive order did not do that because it turns out there is no authority under the DPA to force plants to stay open. Instead, the order left meatpacking plants without any protection for workers, uh, letting tens of thousands of workers get sick and over 20 meatpacking plants uh, to close down. Uh, Ms. Sweat, after President Trump issued his executive order, you and Solicitor of Labor Cato Scanlon issued a statement stating that before issuing citations, quote, OSHA will take into account good faith attempts to follow the joint CDC OSHA meat processing guidance. Uh, so my question, my first question to you is what motivated the issuance of this statement uh, who directed you and the solicitor to issue it? And can you explain what you mean in the statement by good faith attempts? Um, so to start with the good faith effort, it's to look at the guidance that we've issued jointly with CDC. And um, we've seen um, employers in this area already instituting a lot of the um, guidance and, and the information here. So um, there's been some um, you know, proactive measures taken. Uh, OSHA is working with um, Dr. Howard's office and um, uh, FSIS. We're having daily phone calls to um, examine the issues um, surrounding what they're seeing on the ground and what we're seeing. We have active enforcement um, efforts, um, and we've been into these plants for inspections, and we will continue to do that. Uh, how many plants have you all inspected? Um, we have, I think, almost 58 um, meatpacking compliance, uh, sorry, um, enforcement activities uh, right now, and I think we've been into about 10 within the last week. And there have been, the last count I saw, about 11,000 folks infected because of meatpacking plants. Uh, many folks have died. Many of the workers have died. Um, so if an employer shows good faith, is it the case that there will be no OSHA citation? Is that right? Well, good faith and other standards are um, two different things. So I, I would hesitate to comment on um, a straw man, if you will. Uh, enforcement's going to be based on the specifics of what we find in a plant. Well, I don't think it's a straw man. I mean, I think people's lives are literally on the line. Uh, people are getting infected here. These standards are not mandatory standards. We can agree on that. Right. Um, we have existing standards for other activities, sanitation being one of the key, I think, in this area. Um, I, I would like to say um, for a moment, you know, the people that work at OSHA are dedicated to protecting workers and preventing illness, injury, and fatalities. So, um, well, I, let me, and I don't question that, but let me ask you, do you think these standards uh, that have been discussed recently when the pandemic hit, do you think these standards should be mandatory? I think that what we've provided in this guidance is a roadmap to helping protect these workers. Um, it's one element of the response that the government has had. CDC and um, NIOSH have gone into these plants and done wall-to-wall um, -wall, um, epidemiological surveys, and uh, we have access to that information as well. And so I think there's um, a, a variety of people um, across the government who are working to improve the safety and health in these Well, plants. but you've got 11,000 people that, are, that have gotten sick. You've got a lot of people that are dead now. The meatpacking plants, along with nursing homes and cruise ships, have been the places where this thing has spread very rapidly, and yet you don't believe that these standards should be mandatory? I think that people should comply with the law, and if we can continue to put um, the best practices in place, we will um, eventually, and hopefully you know, soon as in tomorrow, eradicate this problem. But it's a challenge, and our folks continue to tackle it. Well, and I also think that the good faith standard is problematic here because can you tell me anywhere else in the OSHA enforcement program, aside from equipment shortages, where good faith gets an employer out of an OSHA citation? I can tell you that upon implementation of the silica standard, uh, we implemented the good faith policy for approximately 30 days. 
um, as employers learned and um, tried to figure out how they were to comply uh, with the um, new silica standard. So it's um, not novel, if you will, and uh, we've seen uh, dramatic compliance with silica now. Thanks for your testimony. Uh, the Trump administration has been woefully inadequate in setting standards, mandatory standards that will save people's lives, even if, as more and more people have become infected and the president has forced these plants to stay open. Uh, and that is an incredible failure of the federal agencies and of the Trump administration. I yield back. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to recognize now the gentleman from Kansas, Mr. Watkins. You're recognized, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Byrne. Thanks to the panelists for coming today. It's my belief, and most people in eastern Kansas' belief, that the president and associated agencies have taken decisive action amid this incredible pandemic. And in fact, it's during this time uh, the response warrants not only just a whole of government approach, but really a, a whole of America approach. And now is the time when we should be looking past partisan politics and come together in order to respond in an appropriate and proportionate manner. And I believe that largely we've done that. And I know, Dr. Howard, you've brought up how uh, conditions and guidance is evolving because we're a learning organization. And, uh, and I also know that, uh, Ms. Sweat, you've pointed out that uh, the guidance is just that because the decision, you know, the decision making authority in, uh, in my opinion ought to be pushed down to more local levels where it could be adopted to a community because they can see uh, their health situation and what applies to them, you know, what might be true in New York City might not be true in Topeka, Kansas. In fact, what might be true in Topeka might not be true in a small town called Iola, Kansas. They, they might know how many hospitals they have, how many uh, P, what PPP, uh, uh, PPE situation is and all. And, um, and so I applaud you for your efforts, um, and I know it's a very challenging time. Uh, getting, uh, Ms. Sweat, getting back to the increased in number of uh, employers and employees who've reached out to you, um, has, the, has there been any particular industry that has reached out more than the other industries? Um, no, I'd say we've seen across the board um, from industries looking for information and guidance. And um, we've provided as many people um, from the agency as possible to talk to folks, either webinars or um, you know, answering other questions. And uh, you know, again, by and large, we do think that employers are trying to do their best to respond to this and the agency will be there to help give them the best information that we can. Thank you. Yeah, and um, Dr. Howard, as the economy regains its strength, you know, most of us agree that the biggest fear and threat here is a deflationary spiral going past these uh, economic lines that we can't return back from. And so obviously uh, we wanna return back to work, we all think, Many of us believe that to be the best stimulus. Uh, we can't simply just print money in, hoping, in hopes that that saves us. And so that makes the CDC and its guidance so incredibly, incredibly important. Uh, does the CDC have specific guidance for companies that, um, you know, that the workers aren't simply w allowed to practice social distancing, perhaps by nature of where they're, how closely they're required to stand? Well, I think the, the paradigmatic uh, type of business that we're familiar with, having done now um, uh, a number of field investigations in these workplaces, is meat uh, processing, uh, where it's extremely labor intensive. People are shoulder to shoulder oftentimes on these production lines. There's nothing closer uh, than, than, than that type of workplace. We've also seen in nursing homes, in hospitals, you have to be close to the patient. You can't do your work 10 feet away from the patient. So there are a number of workplaces in which congregate working situations are significant. And um, in eastern Kansas, we've actually, in my district, we've had a hog slaughtering business that uh, has had a f number of cases. What uh, should I, as a policymaker, what should I know as I approach those business leaders? 
What I would do is take a copy of the CDC OSHA uh, guidance uh, on uh, meat and poultry processing uh, for workers and employers, uh, all 10 pages. Uh, those are our recommendations uh, for, uh, for solving the problem. Excellent. And this, um, this question is generally for both of you. Would you, would you say that we're generally um, trending up or trending down in our capacity to deal with this pandemic? Uh, well, if you look at the case numbers, um, uh, other than some, some notable hotspots, uh, the general numbers in new cases day over day, uh, as well as new fatalities day over day, uh, are going down. Um, as uh, the CDC director has pointed out, uh, there may be a second wave in the fall, uh, coupled with our normal seasonal influenza. So we can't, uh, we can't rest uh, uh, until we uh, take care of the whole problem. Thank you. Um, that does it for my time. Thank you for coming. I appreciate your professionalism and hard work. Madam Chair, I yield. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to recognize the uh, gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Keller. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I'd uh, like to thank uh, both our testifiers for being here today. Um, we do know that uh, the job you do is very important. I appreciate the work you do, and I know the employers that you help appreciate keeping their employees safe, because that, as an employer myself, uh, prior to being, being elected to office, I understand that the most important asset that we have is the people that go to work every day in our businesses, and we want to make sure they're safe. Uh, Mr. Sweat, on, on May 19th, OSHA updated an interim enforcement response plan to increase the use of on-site inspections for all types of workplaces, not just healthcare facilities and emergency responders as OSHA had previously prioritized. Can you explain OSHA's rationale for initially focusing on healthcare and emergency responder cases for on-site inspection and why the agency is now expanding the use of on-site inspections in other, workplace, uh, other workplaces? Thank you. As the pandemic began, online health providers um, were clearly in the, um, you know, the, the most challenging position to address the pandemic. So we put all of our, um, not all, but we put a majority of our resources into um, helping uh, those complaints, um, working with our guidance documents to ensure respirators were available to them. As the um, pandemic has changed, and as the um, country looks to return to work, um, we thought our uh, imposture should change as well. And so um, we've gone from places where um, employers were not actually open, um, which would have also changed our resources, to looking at where people are going to be opening and um, encouraging folks to um, you know, plan and our people will be out. Uh, we have a protocol for how our inspectors uh, will work on site and um, our folks are to do job hazard analysis uh, before they go do inspections so that they can protect themselves as well. Okay. Thank you, I appreciate that. And, and Dr. Howard, I, I think we touched on this a little bit, but I'll just sort of uh, say this. As the economy regains its strength, businesses will continue to take steps to return to full operating capacity. This could be difficult, uh, however, because there are areas and tasks and workplaces where social distancing is simply not feasible. Does the CDC currently have guidance that provides safe alternatives where social distancing is not possible? And if not, would the agency consider providing such guidance to employers and employees? Yes, uh, we have uh, a lot of our guidance uh, uh, does uh, create a default physical distancing, but then when physical distancing is not feasible, we recommend other things such as the wearing of cloth facial coverings. The other question I guess I would have is, as we see and as we move forward and as an employer start to open up their businesses and, and start to, you know, get to more operating capacities and increase that, it, the guidance that they need as it's updated, how readily available or how are we communicating that to our employers so that they have the most up-to-date um, information should we find a better way or a, a, a to protect our employees or a more efficient way of going about it. Is, is that something that's pushed out by, the, by OSHA and CDC or do the employers have to go someplace to look for that? Um, our, our information is available on our website and we've seen a dramatic increase in the use of our website and our guidance documents. 
Um, we link to a lot of CDC uh, guidance, but we're also using all of the social media platforms available. So um, we're trying to reach as many folks as possible. We have a newsletter that's gone from approximately 230,000 to 280,000 subscribers over the last month and a half. So I think people are looking to the agency for information, and we're updating it as quickly as possible when we learn of changes or um, other things that we need to be doing. I would just add one of the other uh, channels that we're using are webinars that are specifically sponsored by employer associations uh, in particular areas. I've done several, uh, the Iron Workers International, for instance, uh, three for the National Safety Council. So webinars are a good way to get uh, information out and then for the uh, uh, attendees to ask questions of government officials. Yeah, I would say as we as we experience things in different parts of the country, there might be a best practice or somebody that's too similar um, manufacturers or processors or what what have you, but somebody may have figured out a best practice. Are, are we able to share that readily uh, across industry? Uh, is that something that we push out a notice to anybody? Can they sign up for like an alert if, an, if something changes, or how does that work? Sure, and I think one of the issues is our guidance, uh, CDC guidance evolves based on what we learn from employers uh, and uh, workers in their particular workplace of how they are making their workplace safer. So, so we include all of that learning into our next version of guidance on the particular industry occupation. Thank you very much. Time is up. Uh, thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Dakota. Mr. Johnson, you recognize that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my line of questioning will be for Dr. Howard. Dr. Howard, last uh, month, uh, the president announced that uh, CDC, OSHA, others should do everything they can to keep uh, meatpacking facilities open, given the critically important role they play in the food supply chain. I was just hoping you could walk us through a bit what uh, the technical uh, advice, guidance, and work your agency has done uh, in continuation of that mission? Well, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have a 10-page uh, guidance that we've done with OSHA, and it's really jam-packed with a lot of very specific information for processing uh, in, uh, in beef, uh, pork, and, and chicken. Um, one of the challenges, as I've mentioned, If you could highlight maybe the top two or three uh, best practices and findings. I just know, particularly in South Dakota, this is an area of uh, high interest because of the Smithfield plant. And I think uh, folks watching at home uh, on the internet, they, they may be interested to know the best recommendations. So, so we start out uh, with a basic recommendation oh, of physical oh, distancing okay. between employees. But as you well know, coming from uh, South Dakota and the Smithfield plant and other plants like that, um, it's very difficult. It's a very labor-intensive process. So what can you do in lieu of that physical distancing? You can try to separate people. Maybe you can put a partition between them so that they're not shoulder to shoulder, or you can protect their breathing zone by the use of a cloth face mask with a face shield, et cetera. One of the things that we've noticed uh, in these plants, and I'll mention this because to me it's a very important best practice, these plants are very, very noisy. And one of the things we've seen, even if you keep individuals separated as much as you can and you keep a cloth face mask and a shield, they sometimes have to speak to each other or a supervisor. And off comes the shield, down comes the mask, and they're shouting at each other, uh, you know, mouth to ear. Uh, that kind of interaction is a possible transmissive event. So if, uh, if, uh, if we can prevent that from happening, that is a best practice that we think would really help. Uh, it's not one that a lot of people know about because people are uh, more knowledgeable about separating the line in terms of employees. The other thing is ventilation in the workplace to make sure that you're moving a lot of air. In a workplace uh, like these plants, you know the temperature is kept very low, which is actually helps the virus. So it's a challenge. The temperatures are low because of food safety issues. So each time you look at one of these best practices, you have to put it into the context of the production facility itself. It is a very challenging thing for us to make recommendations and to get them to be feasible technically within that workplace, a very challenging thing. 
I mean, every location obviously is different. I mean, talk a bit about the role of uh, screens as people go into the workplace. The last time I was at Smithfield, uh, I examined the, the, what appeared to be rather rigorous process they have for people to get into the plant with temperature checks and screening questions. Has that proven to be effective? Is that a, a key best practice? Sure. When you look at the hierarchy of controls, the first step is hazard elimination. Well, the hazard is actually the virus. It just happens to be carried along by people who may not know they're infected. They may be asymptomatic, or they may have a little fever, but a lot of people don't really notice they have a fever. So those checks prior to entry, do you have any symptoms? Symptom questioning. Are you around anybody? Have you been in contact with somebody who has COVID-19? The issue about doing a temperature check. And then some companies are starting actual testing. But testing for the virus is only a snapshot in time. It, it's not, it's not the, it's, it's, it doesn't answer the whole thing as you go through, through time. It gives sometimes workers a false sense of security. So together with those entry checks, then you go into the workplace and you look at engineering controls, administrative controls, and uh, uh, PPE if necessary. So obviously humankind is very good at fighting the last battle, and it does seem that there's high awareness and, and, and packing plants are on high alert, but that's obviously not the only critical portion of this food supply chain. Where's the next place? Where's the next weakness within the food supply chain that we should be attuned to? Well, when you look at the food when it gets to the grocery store and the interaction in that setting, not between workers, between workers and their customer, and oftentimes you see now the same kind of physical distancing engineering controls happening with plexiglass between the clerk and the, the customer. So we're seeing the same fundamental principle, i.e. physical distancing being used in a lot of creative ways depending on the specific workplace that you're in. Thank you, Mr. Thank Dr. Howard, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. I want to remind my colleagues, let me thank the witnesses very much. I want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, materials for submission for the hearing record must be submitted to the committee clerk within 14 days uh, following the last day of the hearing. So by the close of business on June 10th, uh, preferably in Microsoft Word format, the materials submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. Only a member of the subcommittee or an invited witness may submit materials for inclusion in the record. Documents are limited to 50 pages. Documents longer than 50 pages will be incorporated into the record via an internet link uh, that you must provide to the clerk within the required time frame. but recognize that years from now, that link may no longer work. Uh, pursuant to House Resolution 965 and the accompanying regulations, uh, items for the record should be submitted electronically by emailing submissions to Ed and Labor, DOT hearings at mail.house.gov. Member offices are encouraged to submit materials to the inbox before the hearing or during the hearing. At the time uh, the member makes the request, the record will remain open for 14 days per committee practice for additional submissions after the hearing. Again, I want to thank the witnesses for your participation today. What we have heard is very troubling. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for you, and we ask the witnesses to please respond to the questions in writing. The hearing record will be open, uh, held open for 14 days in order to receive, uh, receive those responses. I want to remind my colleagues that pursuant to committee practice, witness questions for the hearing record must be submitted to the majority committee staff or committee clerk within seven days. The question submitted must address the subject matter of the hearing. I now want to recognize the distinguished uh, ranking member for his closing statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. Before I get started, I ask unanimous consent to place in the record letters from the American Hospital Association, the Coalition for Workplace Safety, with 58 additional organizations, and the National Association of Manufacturers providing their views on today's hearing topic. So ordered. Thank you. I want to thank the witnesses. Uh, that was outstanding. You provided this committee and the public with an enormous amount of very important information, and we're grateful to you for it. Uh, sometimes you were asked questions and said it's a yes or no. Unfortunately, this topic does not lend itself to a lot of just simple yes or no answers. 
A lot of members said that this is very important, and they are right. This is extremely important. Uh, and that's why 20 of us, I'm updating my count from my opening, 20 of us uh, decided to be here in person, you know, 13 Republicans and seven Democrats. Uh, we felt strongly enough about it to be here in person. Um, but so did millions of Americans today show up for work and do their jobs in person, because that's what we're supposed to do. When I started preparing for this hearing, I'd looked at it from the point of view of my prior life as a lawyer representing employers that had to comply with OSHA law. And so I said, okay, if one of my clients called me, what kind of advice would I give them? So I went online to see what you guys had put out. And it took me a long time because you've put out a lot of stuff. The benefit of that to both the employers and employees is this. This is a confusing time, and just getting good quality information is about 99% of what we need to do. And good quality information hasn't been exactly easy to come by in this environment. So the guidance you've put out has been extraordinarily important to employers trying to comply with the law, but more importantly, do what they want to do, which is to protect their employees. And you've given that to them, and you're working with them to help them to understand it. The experts have sort of been all over the place about this disease. Early on, oh, it's not a big problem. Oh, no, now it's a big problem. Early on, don't wear face masks. Now you're supposed to wear face masks. We got some experts saying today we shouldn't have shut down, other experts saying we had to shut down. So it's been difficult for all of us to try to figure out, all right, what should we do? And what y'all have tried to do and have done, I believe, is work through this in good faith to try to distill this down, understand it for the rest of us so that we can implement it. And I know it's a changing situation, so you're going to have to change your guidance as we go along. And I appreciate that about what you're doing. We, we've made some uh, mistakes in Washington. Uh, some of the stuff we've done has gone too far, and we've, we've hurt our economy. But we based it on the advice we had at the time from public health experts, <coughs> excuse me, who were dealing with limited information on their part. Uh, some of the projections we got were wildly off the mark. And uh, we're just having to deal with this best we can. I don't see how it helps anything for us to turn to you guys who have this very important obligation in this very difficult time to keep the workplace safe, for us to say stop and go through all the legal mumbo jumbo of doing the standard. There's a difference between keeping people safe and issuing a standard. Issuing a standard in and of itself doesn't keep anybody safe. We have a standard right now. It's called the General Duty Clause. Every employer in America has an obligation under the OSHA General Duty Clause to keep their workplaces safe. There is no question about that. The question is on this environment, what is that duty? The guidance helps describe the duty, and if enforcement is necessary, you use the guidance to determine this employer did not comply with the general duty clause. When I saw the AFL-CL file the lawsuit, I was really disappointed. If there ever was a time for us not to be filing frivolous lawsuits, this would be it particularly a lawsuit against the very departments of the government that we rely upon to keep the workplace safe. We don't need you to be taking time off from that job of keeping the workplace safe to go sitting down with a bunch of lawyers and trying to decide what we got to do to respond to this lawsuit. That's inhibiting workplace safety, not helping it. And, and here in Congress, we passed a, a bill out of the House a couple weeks ago. It's not going anywhere. It's not even going to be taken up in the Senate because of the way it was done and because it's got stuff in it, it's just not acceptable. But it, it, it attempted to deal with this issue, and not once do we have a hearing on it in this committee, the Committee of Jurisdiction. Not once do we bring that bill in this committee to have a markup, the Committee of Jurisdiction on that topic. Not once. If this is so important, why didn't we do it before we passed the bill? Look. We have worked together in this Congress on this disease. We passed almost $3 trillion in spending bills in a very short period of time with huge bipartisan majorities. That's the only way to act in this situation is with a bipartisan commitment to the American people. We need to work together like our constituents are having to do. 
We shouldn't be having partisan hearings. We should show up for work like our constituents do. We should take this seriously like our constituents do. We should understand at the end of the day, it's all of our job to work for a safe workplace. What I said before, the most important part of the American economy, the working men and women of the United States of America. Thank you for what you do every day. We're grateful to you. We're grateful for your presence. And with that, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Byrne. Uh, I now recognize myself for the purpose of making my closing statement. I want to again thank uh, Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary Sweat and Director Howard, uh, both for joining us for this important discussion. I want to thank all of my colleagues who've been here today, those uh, he who are physically here and those who are virtually here. Uh, I do want to emphasize that the ETS and the HEROES Act is not a, a rigid or inflexible one-size-fits-all standard that fails to accommodate uh, changing scientific knowledge. The text of the HERO Act calls uh, for an ETS to require an infection control panel based on the hazards in this, that specific workplace. It requires assessment of risks in that workplace and a plan tailored to the particular workplace. Development of the plan should involve employees. This is not a required rigid standard. Uh, second, uh, California OSHA has an airborne transmissible standard. It applies to COVID and healthcare and has not been a one size uh, fits all. Um, let me just say that uh, what we heard today is that in the middle of this global health emergency, it's causing more deaths in less time than any other workplace crisis that OSHA has faced in its 50-year existence. OSHA stubbornly refuses to use its authority to protect this nation's workers. The failure to act is a stunning act of abdication by the senior leaders in the Department of Labor. When workers are demanding strong standards and enforcement of those standards, Instead, we get voluntary guidance that employers can choose to comply with if it's convenient. And the best OSHA can offer is threats to use a, a largely toothless general duty clause. When OSHA inspectors do occur, they happen uh, too often after the bodies are in, in the morgue, rather than when the prevention can make a difference. When employers need clear standards so that they know when they've met their obligation, to make their workplaces safe. Instead, they get vague, generic suggestions. Uh, this is not how the architects of the Occupational Safety and Health Act envision OSHA's response during a workplace crisis. The act tells us that, that the OSHA shall issue an emergency temporary standard if it determines that workers are exposed to a grave danger or from new hazards and that a standard is necessary to protect workers from that hazard. Not only do the large numbers of sick and dying tell us that there is a grave danger, but it's clear that the limited actions taken by OSHA are not sufficient. Not only is OSHA refusing to act on the emergency authority, but the agency won't even resume work on a large awaited permanent standard that would address the hazard of, that this nation is facing. And so as the economy reopens, the key to preventing an even more devastating second wave will be protecting workers in the millions of workplaces that present exposure hazards. Yet we have no mandatory standard, no cop on the beat to enforce safe working conditions that will be the key to preventing that second wave. And it's deeply disappointing that OSHA, the only federal agency with the authority to enforce safe working conditions, is missing in action. And I'm not only disappointed, but I'm saddened for the workers of this country who continue to lack adequate protections on the job, and when they go home, they will infect their families. And I'm upset about the future of this country that OSHA's inaction foreshadows. And I can only hope that you and Secretary Scalia will wake up before it's too late and choose to fulfill OSHA's mission to assure safe working conditions for every man and for every woman in this country. 
If there is no further business or uh, without objection, the committee stands adjourned. Thank you.